Leaving GX, we had seen the meta move more in the last 8 months than we had in the entire rest of the era combined. With the release of Phantom Darkness at the start of 2008, Dark Arm Dragon released a plague onto the meta resulting in the second ever Tier 0 format in Return Dad. This was luckily quelled by both an emergency ban list and the release of Light of Destruction, both in May, leaving the meta fairly balanced between Return and Turbo Dad variants, Gladiator Beast and Light Sworn, with the results favoring Gladiator Beast among these three. This was all about the change, as with the next core set, a new era of the game would begin bringing the first ever new summoning mechanic since the DM era and setting the stage for a tier 0 resurgence. The Duelist Genesis Release date, September 2nd, 2008 Set type, Core Set Major Strategies, Synchros, Psychics Impact, New Era, Bigger Problem the Duelist Genesis was the true start of the 5D's era in full, bringing the first big wave of playable tuners and synchro monsters to the game, and with it would come a deck that would make itself known rapidly in the format and proceed to dominate through the rest of the year. For the first wave of generic synchros not tied to a specific strategy, we received Stardust Dragon, Red Dragon Archfiend, and Goyo Guardian, all three of which would be available as 10 promos outside of the set too with Stardust Dragon and Red Dragon Archfiend having already been released a couple of weeks earlier in the first wave of this year's collectible tins, and Goyo Guardians being later in the month as part of a new tin set known as the Exclusive Tins, making all three extremely easy to access for the new mechanic. Of these three, Stardust Dragon and Goyo Guardian would be by far the most used, with the former being a level 8 that contribute itself to negate any effect that destroys a card, reviving itself at the end of the turn, and the latter being a level 6 able to steal anything it destroys in battle. In addition to these, we also received the first ever new monster type in the game's history, being the Psychic type, who all seemed to be revolving around paying life points for stronger than average effects. These included Mind Master, a level 1 tuner who could pay 800 and tribute another Psychic to summon a level 4 lower Psychic from deck, notably not once per turn, Krebens, a level 2 tuner that can negate any attack that targets it by paying 800 life points, Psychic Commander, a level 3 tuner that can pay up to 500 life points in the damage step when a Psychic battles to drain that much attack and defense from the opposing monster. Magical Android, a level 5 synchro that gives the controller back 600 life points for every Psychic they control at the end phase. Thought Ruler Archfiend, a level 8 synchro that gains life points when it destroys something in battle and can negate a spell or trap that targets a Psychic by paying 1000 life points. And probably the most blatantly overpowered card of the bunch, Emergency Teleport, which special summons a level 3 or lower Psychic from deck, banishing it during the end phase. Emergency Teleport, or e -Tele, was by far and away one of the best cards from the entire set, as it made Synchro Summoning incredibly simple in almost every deck thanks to Mind Master, Krebons, and Psychic Commander all being tuners summonable by the spell, meaning that you had access to a level 1, 2, or 3 tuner on command. This spell would also be a catalyst of sorts for the next tier 0 mega threat that was about to make itself known, but we'll get to that soon enough. For the TCG exclusives, we received a couple of extremely interesting pieces here aimed at either creating new strategies or strengthening already popular ones, with the beginnings of a fairy synchro strategy with Herald of Orange Light and Avenging Knight Parshath, support to the previous Six Samurai deck and Hand of the Six Samurai, and probably the most impactful in the short term, Charge of the Light Brigade, a search spell for Light Sworn monsters that milled three to search, giving the deck far more consistency moving forward. As for OCG imports, the only one of note here was the Tricky, a level 5 monster that can be special summoned from the hand by discarding a card, which would see occasional play as a combo enabler. Gladiator Beast would receive two new incredibly powerful pieces in a quest, who returned a Gladiator Beast card from Grave to Hand on Tagout Summon, which could include spells and traps if they included the full archetype name, and War Chariot to pair with it, which was a monster effect negating counter trap as long as you control the Gladiator Beast monster, notably able to be recycled with a quest. Book of Eclipse was a board-wide Book of Moon for the turn, notable for being able to stun synchro pushes by flipping a board down temporarily. Lastly, Gear Town was a field spell that let you summon an ancient gear monster for one less tribute, but that's not what it was used for. Its second effect let you special summon an ancient gear monster from the deck when destroyed and sent to the grave, which included the previously released Gachiltron Dragon, meaning you could special summon a 3000 attack body by destroying the field spell. 
A fun quirk of the game's rules at the time was that by setting a new field spell over a currently active one, the previous one was considered destroyed by this action, meaning that by setting a gear town over gear town, you could destroy gear town manually and summon the Gachiltron dragon from deck that way, making it a popular option in skill drain related beatdown strategies. SJC Baltimore would be the first event with synchros involved in an impactful way, taking place on September 6th, and while yes, they were impactful, it wasn't necessarily for the reason you'd expect. One new face of the format made itself quite powerfully known right out the gate with this event, being the introduction of the newly coined Teledad, a mixture of the previous Dad Turbo with the new pieces from Duelist Genesis, namely Emergency Teleport and Krebons. Because Krebons was a dark monster, by using him to synchro with either a level 4 or 6 monster like Dark Greffer or Malicious, you could summon out Stardust Dragon or Goyo Guardian and put two dark monsters into the grave, making it trivially easy to summon Dad on top of it. Teledad would move from here to be one of the most oppressively overpowered decks in the entire history of the game, being one of the few decks to ever reach the tier 0 position, which it would achieve over the coming months. However, it wouldn't be the only deck rocking new tools from Duelist Genesis. Gladiator Beast came to play this event by using the new Equest and War Chariot to bolster the already powerful strategy, taking first place piloted by Dremol Jupiter, who notably also included a Krebens in the side deck to potentially use Synchro Monsters in games 2 and 3. SJC Tulsa would take place three weeks later on September 27th, and at that point, Teledad had firmly taken over the format with 11 of the top 16 spots. There were a couple of other notable performances here, like Zombie claiming a top spot using a combination of Mizuki to fuel aggressive plays and Raikou to provide removal and grave setup, as well as Lightsworn having a bit of a resurgence thanks mostly to Charge of the Light Brigade smoothing out their play lines. But neither of these could stop Teledad from taking this event piloted by Adam Korn for a second major event victory after him winning US Nats in 2007. SJC Seattle would be a week later on October 4th and show an even heavier skew in favor of the new format Overlord, taking not only 13 of the top 16 spots, but also the entirety of the top 8, with the winning pilot being Cesar Gonzalez for a second SJC victory. SJC Charlotte took place two weeks later on October 18th, and it was clear that nothing was going to stop or change Teledad's performance, claiming 15 of the top 16 spots. Justin Arwin would be the winning pilot to take home first place here, with most builds becoming increasingly centralized as the months progress, seeing the tuner line trimmed to only Krebens, and the inclusion of Snipe Hunter in the list having almost become staple, able to unbrick openings by loading darks from the hand into the grave. We would see a couple of releases left in the year that would attempt to break up the increasingly centralized meta, but at this stage it was clear that the age of Teledad was in full swing, and practically nothing in these upcoming releases was going to stop that. Zombie World. Release date, October 21st, 2008. Set type, Structure Deck. Major Strategies, Zombie. Impact, Reprints for a Tier 3 Strategy. The Zombie World Structure Deck was meant as a sort of precursor to what was about to release in the next core set by placing a heavy emphasis on stealing an opponent's monsters destroyed by battle if they're zombies, being a pseudo-type mechanic like how Psychics did with the life point costs. This was present in both Red Eye Zombie Dragon and Paladin of the Cursed Dragon, two new monsters from this structure deck able to steal a zombie either that they destroyed in battle in Zombie Dragon's case, or in the grave because it was destroyed by battle in Paladin's case. This was all enabled by the new field spell Zombie World, which made all monsters on both players' field and graves zombies, and prevented tribute summoning non-zombie type monsters, with the latter effect allowing the card to see side deck play against monarch strategies. The structure deck also provided reprints of Pyramid Turtle, Spirit Reaper, Zombie Master, Cold Wave, Magical Stone Excavation, Card of Safe Return, Book of Life, Terraforming, Pot of Avarice, Soul Taker, Card Destruction, and Bottomless Trap Hole, with some being great generic staple reprints and the others being great zombie strategy reprints. In addition to this, the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX manga Volume 2 released on November 4th, and with it came Thunder King Ryo, a monster that locked adding cards from deck to hand outside of drawing while on the field, and could be tributed to negate the inherent special summon of a monster being an almost instant staple in stun strategies. This could be seen at SJC Chicago just under two weeks later on November 15th, where Teledad would still be the dominant force in the meta, but Hero Beat would squeeze into the top 16 playing the newly released Ryo, now placing more focus on the light attribute with Freed the Brave Warrior and Honest. A new variant of Lightsworn would also crack into the top 8 here, 
being Twilight, which combined the normal Lightsworn strategy with a tech thin copy of Dark Arm Dragon and Phantom of Chaos, able to provide the dad push as well as Phantom able to copy milled copies of Judgment Dragon for the board wipe effect. Ryan Spicer would take the event piloting Teledad, as to be expected in the format seeing little to no change in the deck lineup since its last outing. That standard lineup was about to change, however, as the next core set was just around the corner and would bring new tools to attempt to shake up the meta, but would only make the already present issues worse. Crossroads of Chaos Release date, November 18th, 2008 Set type, core set Major strategies, plants, Zombies, Morphtronic. Impact, The Menace Grows Stronger. Crossroads of Chaos would be the final core set of 2008, and it would continue the push of new generic synchro tools to work with thanks to its headlining card, Black Rose Dragon. A level 7 synchro that has the ability to banish a plant from grave to change a monster from defense to attack mode and its attack to zero. Oh yeah, and on Synchro Summon it can nuke the board. This card alone would immediately shift decklist compositions, as with the previous pool, once people had refined lists, they had cut Psychic Commander from most e -Telly lists because the level 7 pool was not really worth the investment, but now e -Telly plus any level 4 monster could result in a full board wipe. Black Rose Dragon would become a staple of extra decks moving forward, boosted by the second wave of the collectible tins also providing an easy access copy of it alongside Turbo Warrior, who no one asked for. This was meant to be paired with the new plant support like Nettles, a level 2 plant tuner, Titanial Princess of Camellias, a boss monster who could tribute any plant you control to negate a card that targets, and Miracle Fertilizer, a once per turn monster reborn for plants at the cost of your normal summon and is destroyed once a monster it summons leaves the field. While a solo plant deck would not take off from this, Titanial would see experimentation as a splash option for some decks thanks to the previously released TCG exclusive Lone Fire Blossom who could tribute itself to summon Titanial straight from the deck, which would become a popular option over the course of the era once the elephant in the room was eventually dealt with. Zombies received further support here in the form of their new synchros Doomkaiser Dragon and Revive King Hades, with the former able to steal a zombie from the opponent's grave and summon it on Synchro Summon, and the latter able to negate the effects of anything destroyed in battle by a zombie monster permanently. Both of these were locked to only being able to be summoned by the tuner Plague Spreader Zombie, a level 2 zombie tuner that could revive itself by stacking a card from hand on top of the deck, but was banished after it left the field if it used this effect. Plague Spreader was almost instantly picked up, not for zombies, but as a dark monster that enabled synchro plays and could remove itself from the grave to manipulate your dark monster count. That's right, it's Teledad support. It also helped that Plague Spreader was without question the best standalone tuner we had at this stage, as it would see play throughout the rest of the era thanks to its versatility. Morphtronic as an archetype would be introduced here, a series of machines that gained different effects based on whether they were in attack or defense mode with Selfon able to summon a Morphtronic from the top cards of your deck based on a die roll while in attack mode, Boomboxen able to attack twice while in attack mode, Radeon boosting Morphtronic monster's attack while in attack mode and defense while in defense mode, and Accelerator able to return a Morphtronic in hand to deck to pop a card on the field and draw a card. While Morphtronic would not be meta, the occasional pop-up would happen for an OTK strategy surrounding Boomboxen and Radeon, able to boost Boomboxen to ridiculous attack totals thanks to limiter removal and other cards. The Iron Chain archetype would be introduced here, being a series of monsters aimed at milling and burning the opponent, with the only useful piece here being Iron Chain Dragon, a generic level 6 synchro that mills the opponent for 3 on battle damage. Whitestone of Legend would be a level 1 dragon tuner able to search a blue eyes white dragon when sent to grave, being a useful tool for Exodia related strategies by providing a search for a trade in target when discarded. Spellcaster strategies received a couple of new interesting pieces in Secret Village of Spellcasters, a field spell that locked the opponent from using spells if you control the spellcaster, and locked yourself if you didn't, as well as the TCG exclusives Night End Sorcerer, a level 2 tuner who banished up to 2 cards from the opponent's grave on special summon, and Tempest Magician, who gained a spell counter on summon, could discard spells to stack more onto monsters you controlled, and could remove all spell counters from the board to burn the opponent for 500 for each becoming a build around for FTK strategies. Goes and Match was seen as a bit of a counterpart to Rivalry of Warlords, locking both players to only one attribute, seeing a lot of usage in stun strategies of the time and in side decks. Lastly are the two remaining TCG exclusives worth talking about, being Gladiator Beast Rediari, who banished a card in the opponent's grave on its tagout summon, and Treacherous Trap Hole, which destroyed two monsters on the field if you had no traps in grave. 
This release would lead into the last set of the year three days later, and any hope of changing the format would have to rest on its one new card. And while it would change many aspects of the game, the meta would not be one of them. Dark Legends. Release date, November 21st, 2008. Set type, reprint set. Major strategies, promos and hard to get cards. Impact, a new menace to the battle phase. Dark Legends was entirely sold as a reprint set, primarily reprinting cards from the first three sets of the game, where most of the good cards among them were once again banned, but had an interesting kicker of the set being the reprint of previously harder to get promos or one-off cards that were in one set before this. These included reprints of cards like Green Baboon, Scapegoat, Dark Bribe, Card Trooper, Destiny Hero Malicious, Destiny Draw, Melteel Sage of the Sky, Nova Summoner, and Galenduo. However, there was one brand new card also included in the set, and he was without question the biggest impact. This particular set was exclusively sold at Walmart at the time in blister packs of two with a promo included in each, and that promo was Gores the Emissary of Darkness who could, when you take battle damage with nothing on the field, summon itself and trigger an additional effect based on what kind of damage it was, being burning the opponent for the same amount in the case of effect damage, or summoning a token with stats equal to the damage taken in the case of battle damage. The battle damage effect made Gores an absolute staple to the meta, seeing a play in absolutely every deck of the era with very little exception, as now attacking into a completely clear board caused a significant mind game on whether the opponent had Gores or not. It also caused a change in player behavior that would stick around for many years after the fact, where players, when attacking directly, would now attack with their monsters in the order of lowest to highest attack value as to not be countered by the Gores token. One of the few cases in the history of the game where player behavior was changed by a single card. SJC Atlanta would be on the next day on November 22nd, and as a note, though Gores was released at this point, he was not easy to receive prior to this event due to the tendency of Walmart's not stocking Yu-Gi-Oh product on the day of release, making a Walmart exclusive promo incredibly difficult to find on release day. As for meta shifts, the only new deck we'd see in the top cut here from the Crossroads release was Zombie Teledad, which was a variant of Teledad using Zombie Package to help manipulate graveyard counts and provide draw power with Card of Safe Return seeing Plague Spreader Zombie instantly finding success. Jerry Wang would win the event with the standard Teledad, being his second SJC victory this year, seeing minimal change to the standard deck list outside of the introduction of a single copy of Plague Spreader Zombie. This was followed by the last event of the year, being SJC Detroit on December 6th, and barring a surprise top from Gadget, the meta was mostly what we'd expected at this stage, seeing Gore slotted into many of the decks ending in the top 16. Stephen Harris would take his second SJC title this year with Teledad, playing not only Gores, but also a single copy of Psychic Commander to access Black Rose Dragon with any level 4, and Tempest Magician with a single copy of Breaker the Magical Warrior. This would conclude the events of 2008 in the Yu-Gi-Oh! metagame, but a significant change was on the horizon for the game as a whole. Up until this point in history, the TCG side of Yu-Gi-Oh! had been entirely managed by Upper Deck, as they had purchased the distribution rights for the game prior to its overseas release. In October of 2008, a lawsuit was filed by Konami in the state of California against the company Vintage Sports Cards Incorporated, alleging the company was distributing packages containing counterfeit rare Yu-Gi-Oh! cards. Konami was granted an injunction against VSC in this process, but during the discovery process they found evidence that alleged the counterfeit cards VSC was distributing were provided to them by Upper Deck Entertainment, the distributor of Yu-Gi-Oh! for the TCG. This discovery would begin a months-long endeavor between Konami and Upper Deck, resulting in the complete removal of Upper Deck from all TCG-related products and activities, having Konami fully seize control of the game from that point forward. This is an important point to realize going into 2009, as from roughly this point forward, Upper Deck and their version of the TCG would slowly fade into obscurity as Konami took over and would be making any and all decisions for the state of the game moving forward, for better and for worse. It was still to be determined how this would affect the game moving forward, but regardless, moving into 2009 with the reign of Teledad still in full swing, it was only a matter of time before some kind of change would finally come along and kill the beast. As we leave the wreckage of the meta that was the end of 2008's metagame, changes were on the horizon. We had just entered the 5D's era proper, and since its start, Teledad was an uncontrollable beast, taking over every event's top cut and threatening to do the same going into 2009 with no shot at a ban list until March unless an emergency one would drop. 
In addition to this, a lawsuit was raging on in the background, as Konami vs. Upper Deck had come to a head with Konami refusing to provide product to Upper Deck for distribution. With Upper Deck issuing a statement saying that the newest set of champion packs, the packs used as entry compensation and prizing at LCS tournaments, was not provided to them for distribution, to which Konami issued a statement claiming that it was due to Konami terminating the contract between the two companies, even though the issue was still being debated in court. Because of this, there was no beginning of the year set release that would usually kick off the year, meaning we're going to be jumping straight into the SJC circuit. SJCs this particular year are also going to be a bit of a sticky situation, as the Shonen Jump Championships were mostly an upper deck creation, meaning that with the constant fluctuation from Konami v Upper Deck, SJCs were going to slow off tremendously this year compared to the previous years, resulting in only 7 SJCs in the entirety of 2009, two of which would happen before the lawsuit would be settled. SJC San Francisco would take place on January 10th, and surprising no one, Teledad's Tier 0 reign was still in full swing, taking 12 of the top 16, with the remaining top spots going to decks we've seen previously. Alejandro Reyes would win the day on Teledad, seeing a fairly standard lineup to those we've seen recently with more emphasis placed on discard tools like Snipe Hunter and Phoenix Wing Wind Blast. SJC Houston would follow a week later on January 17th, and we'd see yet another dominating performance from Teledad, taking 14 of the top 16, as well as first place piloted by Jerry Wang, claiming his third SJC title, with his list dropping some of the discard tools in favor of Special Summon Negation with cards like Royal Oppression and Solemn Judgment. We would also see a new set of Shonen Jump promos hit mailboxes around this time, and both were powerful in very different ways. The first of these was Dandelion, who special summoned two level 1 fluff tokens when sent to Grave. While the card had already been preemptively limited, Dandelion would make some decks playing plant options like Lone Fire more consistent, although its true power would come later in the era due to its synergy with two plant tuners that had not yet been released. The second was a new dragon boss monster and Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon, a level 10 boss that could be special summoned by banishing a dragon on field and could special summon a dragon from Grave once per turn. While Red Med was notably powerful, he was inconsistent to set up at this time, as its most consistent enabler, Red Eyes Wyvern, was exclusive to the EU at this time thanks to its inclusion in the Tag Force 3 bundle overseas. Because of this, Wyvern was not legal to play in US tournaments, along with its sister promo Gallus the Star Beast, until it received some form of US reprint. With that established, set releases were about to begin rolling again, as in mid-February, a decision was reached in the California court system, ordering Upper Deck to, effective immediately, stop all association with Konami's trademark property and disassociate itself from the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game, returning all control of the game and its surrounding environment back into the hands of Konami. Because of this shift, all SJCs in 2009 were placed on a temporary hold as control of the game shifted back to Konami meaning we won't be seeing any further tournament results until around April, when the tournament scene would slowly start back up again. Duelist Pack Yusei Release Date, February 24th, 2009 Set Type, Duelist Pack Major Strategies, Synchron, Warrior Impact, a couple of new Synchro Toolbox tools Duelist Pack Yusei, being the first set to emerge from the release purgatory, brought next to nothing new for the game, but it did bring two specific cards that would see play. The first of these was Tuning Wear, being a level 1 machine that could be considered level 2 for a synchro summon and drew the user a card when it was used as synchro material. Tuning Wear would specifically see experimentation alongside machine duplication, similarly to how Card Trooper was used previously, as it, with practically any tuner, allowed access to almost any generic synchro in the current pool using this combination, drawing heavily when you did. The other card was Armory Arm, a level 4 synchro that could be equipped to a monster, boost its attack by a thousand, and deal damage to the opponent any time the equipped monster destroyed another monster in battle equal to the attack of the destroyed monster. Armory Arm would be a staple of extra decks as the only level 4 generic synchro for the time, but also because of an OTK it could pull off in certain circumstances with Colossal Fighter. In a case where the opponent has a monster on field with 1900 or more attack, you could make both Armory Arm and Colossal Fighter, equip Armory Arm to the opponent's monster, and repeatedly slam Colossal Fighter into it, burning the opponent for 28 and reviving the Colossal Fighter each time you did. 
This OTK came up rarely at the time, but it was something that did come up on occasion, cementing Armory Arm and Colossal Fighter as staple pieces of the extra deck for a good time after. This release was followed by the March 1st ban list, and this list had a single goal in mind. Kneecap Teledad as hard as it is necessary to end the Tier 0 meta. Newly limited were Chaos Sorcerer, up from 0, Dad, down from 2, Gladiator Beast Bestiari, down from 3, Goyo Guardian, down from 3, Mizuki, down from 3, Plague Spreader Zombie, down from 3, Card of Safe Return, down from 2, Emergency Teleport, down from 3, and Rhoda, down from 3. Newly semi-limited were Destiny Hero Malicious, down from 3, Goblin Zombie, down from 3, Green Baboon, up from 1, Ryza, up from 1, Summoner Monk, a preemptive hit to an upcoming release, Allure of Darkness, down from 3, Destiny Draw, down from 3, Gold Sarcophagus, up from 1, Mind Crush, up from 1, and Ultimate Offering, up from 1. Lastly, Unlimited Hero Romanticore of Darkness from 2, Phantom of Chaos from 2, Twin-Headed Behemoth from 1, Book of Moon from 2, and Nobleman of Crossout from 2. This list did a ton to hurt both Teledad and the competition that would have risen up around it, with Dad, Goyo, Plague Spreader, E-Telly, Rhoda, Malicious, Allure, and Destiny Draw all being hits to the deck pure, and Mizuki, Card of Safe Return, and Goblin Zombie being hit to the deck's zombie variant as well as other zombie decks that would have risen from Dad's fall. In addition to this, Bestiari taking a hit here was entirely thanks to the meta prior to Teledad, as with Teledad gone, there would be a strong chance that Gladiator Beast would just take over again. This set the baseline for the meta moving into the first core set release of the year, and almost every player was ready for it to bring something new to shake up the increasingly stale metagame. Crimson Crisis Release date, March 3rd, 2009. Set type, Core Set. Major Strategies, Assault Mode, Blackwing, Reactor. Impact, The Birth of an Icon. Crimson Crisis would end the drought far more effectively than Duelist Pack you say before it, as it was a follow-up to a massive ban list that upended the Tier 0 meta and brought a ton of new tools for both new strategies and older meta presences. Its highlight strategy, though, would not be an effective one, being the Assault Mode series. This series of monsters, being souped up versions of synchros, would reside in the main deck until you activated Assault Mode Activate while the corresponding synchro was on field, tributing the synchro to allow you to summon the Assault Mode variant directly from deck. If this sounds clunky, that's because it is. Even with tools like Assault Beast to get Activate easier, the entire mechanic was rough because if you drew the Assault Mode variant, it couldn't be summoned and was simply a dead card. Even with tools to offset this like Assault Teleport, as those would be dead if you didn't brick on the bricks in your deck, meaning you've just added more bricks. As for the Assault Modes themselves, the only one of note here was Red Dragon Archfiend, as he nuked all other monsters when he attacked, but this wasn't even enough to let the strategy see play. No. The true meta strategy that would come from this instead was Black Wings, a series of winged beasts that focused on swarming the board to make synchro pushes. With its initial wave, we received three main deck monsters and one synchro, being Sirocco, a 2000 attack level 5 that can be normaled for no tribute if your opponent controls a monster and you don't, able to combine the attacks of all black wings onto a single monster for a turn, Bora, who can be special summoned if you control a black wing and pierces, Gale, a level 3 tuner with the same swarm condition and can cut an opponent's monster's stats in half once per turn, and Armor Master, a level 7 synchro that can't be destroyed in battle, takes no battle damage, places counters on anything it attacks and doesn't kill, and can remove all of its counters from the board to drop an affected monster's attack and defense to zero that turn. Without a doubt, Blackwing showed the most potential moving forward from this release, as while it wasn't enough now to make it a meta mainstay threat, it was potent enough to be mixed in with some already powerful dark decks and gave decks easy access to level 7 synchros, which became far more important with another release from the set. Frogs received another wave of support here in Dupe, who blocked attacking any monster other than itself, which could be paired with a second to lock all attacking, Flip Flop Frog, who bounced monsters up to the number of face-up frogs on flip, able to flip itself back down, and Submarine, a TCG exclusive who dealt piercing damage. Of these, Dupe would see some experimentation thanks to Treeborn and Substitute, especially since Substitute and any other monster by itself could form a dupe lock as it became known. 
Another new archetype here was the Reactor Monsters, a series of monsters that burned the opponent for 800 once per turn when they activated the corresponding card type. Being monsters for Summon Reactor SK, traps for Trap Reactor Y-Fi, spells for Spell Reactor RE, and any card for Flying Fortress Skyfire. The deck never took off thanks to the simple fact that a once per turn burn effect does not carry the potential to end a game in and of itself, on top of the fact that the monsters were all fairly weak, meaning they were easy to out. However, grouped with this release was also a tuner named Black Salvo, who revived a level 4 Dark Machine on Normal Summon, negating its effects on the field. This was yet another level 7 Synchro Enabler, which primarily was meant to enable the new Synchro Dark Strike Fighter, a level 7 who contribute a monster to burn the opponent for its level times 200, which was, at the time, not once per turn and could be used in main phase 2. This card was, without hyperbole, one of, if not the absolute best, Synchro released in the entire 5Ds era, as it enabled any deck that could make a level 7 Synchro to OTK the opponent by tributing off your board after the battle phase to unload absurd amounts of damage, which could include itself for an additional 1400. Gladiator Beast received a massive piece of support here in Sam Knight, whose effect absolutely did not matter. What mattered about Sam Knight was the fact that it was a level 3 beast, meaning it was summonable using Rescue Cat, which enabled a combo where you summoned it and Test Tiger with one Rescue Cat, enabling you to immediately tag it out for any Gladiator Beast with their effect. Alien received a wave of support to attempt to make them playable in the 5Ds era here with Ammonite, a level 1 tuner that revived an alien on normal, Overlord, who could special summon itself by removing two A-counters from the field and could place an A-counter on all opponent's monsters once per turn, Golgar, a level 5 Synchro that could bounce all face-up spells and traps to place that many A-counters on the board and could remove two A-counters from the board to destroy a card once per turn, Kid, a TCG exclusive that placed an A-counter on any monster special summon to the opponent's field, Code A Ancient Ruins, a TCG exclusive which generates A counters when an alien is destroyed and can remove two A counters from the field once per turn to revive an alien, Mysterious Triangle, which popped a monster with A counters and summoned an alien from deck, and Planet Pollutant Virus, which tributed an alien to destroy all monsters with A counters on the opponent's field, then placed an A counter on any monster summoned to the opponent's field for three turns. Alien support here was a major revitalization of the strategy, giving the archetype a lot of power in the format, but would move to do absolutely nothing in the meta due to the clunky nature of counters as a mechanic, leading many to not approach the strategy in the first place. Debris Dragon was a level 4 tuner that revived a 500 attack or lower monster on normal summon, but could only make dragon synchros and couldn't be synchroed with a level 4. While Debris at this point would see minimal play, he was worth noting due to providing access to either Iron Chain Dragon or Black Rose Dragon with its own normal summon. Arcanite Magician was a new level 7 synchro option for spellcaster decks, providing both spell counter generation and spot removal, seeing play alongside cards from the next structure deck release. Telekinetic Power Well provided severe swarming for psychic decks, able to summon any number of level 2 or lower psychics from the grave at the cost of a heavy sum of life points seeing experimentation but very little success in its time. Totem Dragon was a TCG exclusive that provided two tributes for Dragon Monster tribute summons, able to revive itself if the only monsters in Grave are dragons, banishing itself when it leaves the field after being summoned this way. Lastly, OCG imports brought us niche cards to experiment with like Tethys, Adio, and Zeta Reticulant. In addition to the core set release, there were a couple of promos released at this point too, starting with the Shonen Jump promo for March, being Chimera Tech Fortress Dragon, able to be contact fused using Cyber Dragon and any number of other machines from either field, turning Cyber Dragon into the ultimate side deck tool against any machine deck, as you could now special summon it and wipe the board before even beginning your main play line. Lastly, the Duelist Pack Collection 10s released on March 10th, and they would bring arguably the only good Assault Mode monster, being Stardust Dragon Assault Mode, who contributed itself to negate anything, reviving itself at the end of the turn. This particular Assault Mode monster would spark some experimentation with the strategy thanks to an Omni Negate being worth intensive investment at the time, but it would still fail to see any major success. This period of time would feel like a lot changed, but with nothing to show for it, as the SJC circuit was still on hold following the lawsuit settlement, meaning that no events would take place between Crimson Crisis's release and the release of the next new structure deck a few weeks later. Spellcaster's Command Release date, March 31st, 2009 Set type, Structure Deck Major Strategies, 
Spellcasters. Impact, a new staple combo enabler. Spellcasters Command was an interesting release at the time due to its reliance on spell counter generation, a mechanic that was consistently seeing support trickled out for it, but was seeing little to no success in the competitive space due to the clunky nature of counters. New cards that the deck brought included Endymion, the Master Magician, Disenchanter, Defender, the Magical Knight, Magical Citadel of Endymion, Spell Power Grasp, and easily the best new card from this release, Summoner Monk. Monk allowed the user to discard a spell once per turn to special summon a level 4 monster from deck, which would instantly see experimentation in various strategies thanks to the ability to spam out level 4 monsters like Armageddon Knight, Dark Greffer, or Rescue Cat, which allowed you to push advantage further. As for reprints, this structure deck brought Crystal Seer, Econ, Apprentice Magician, Breaker the Magical Warrior, Book of Moon, and Giant Trunade, showing not the best reprint selection, but also not the worst, hitting some necessary cards like Breaker with its constantly fluctuating banless status. This wouldn't be the only set bringing reprints for this cycle, as just under a month later, we'd see a revision of one of the better ideas from the previous year's set releases. Gold Series 2009. Release date, April 21st, 2009. Set type, Reprint Set. Major Strategies, The Meta Threats of 2008. Impact, A Severe Lowering of the Price Floor. Gold Series 2009 was attempt number two at the Gold Series formula, and in all fairness, this time it was a really effective swing. Practically every strategy that had cropped up near the end of the GX era had some form of significant reprint here, including cards for strategies that were still the top of the meta. And more importantly, while there were some short printings in the set, it was nowhere near as severe as the previous year's Gold series, coming out to a negligible difference in pull ratios. Reprints here included Sangan, all six of the Monarchs, Treeborn Frog, Snipe Hunter, Six Samurai Staples, the Volcanic Engine, Necro Gardna, Elemental Heroes Captain Gold and Neos Alias, Test Tiger, Dad, Prime Material Dragon, Giant Trunade, Mind Control, Future Fusion, Solemn Judgment, Bottomless, Compulse, Phoenix Wing, and Gold Sarcophagus, which was its first reprint from its time as the SJC prize card. This did tremendous work for the secondary market of the game, bringing down the price of many decks in the meta, but reprints weren't the only change here. The May 2009 issue of Shonen Jump would bring yet another relevant promo to the field in Beast King Barbaros. A 3000 attack monster that could either be summoned with no tributes to have 1900 attack, or be summoned with three tributes to nuke the opponent's board. While the three tribute effect would almost never come up, the no tribute effect became its shining attribute, as when summoned this way, if you had a way to negate its effects, its attack would reset back up to 3000, giving skill drain beat decks a new threat to play with. This tool was on full display with SJC Anaheim a week later, being the first SJC in a long time that wasn't completely dominated by Teledad, seeing a decent spread of decks to crack the top 16. Going through the top cut, the most represented deck was easily Light Sworn, seeing 7 of the top 16, primarily thanks to its competition's repeated hits on the ban list compared to its singular minor hit of JD to 2. The deck was still a powerhouse, seeing most players opting for cards like Honest and Beckoning Light to push advantage. In a similar vein, there was also a single top from its sister deck in Twilight, which was effectively Light Sworn with an added Dad package to give it a little more firepower, also including Phantom of Chaos to copy either Dad or JDs that were in the graveyard for instant board pressure. Gladiator Beast performed well here with three top spots, integrating Sam Knight for Rescue Cat lines, as well as some players opting for Phantom Dragon to punish early aggression pushes. Blackwing would have its first top cut showing here of many to come, integrating the deck's access to level 7 synchros with Black Salvo and Dekoichi to easily access Dark Strike Fighter on a moment's notice. This was a very common sight in the format, known as Cat Format, to have some way to access Dark Strike Fighter to clean up games, as the power of the ability to tribute off your board to burn the opponent out from a reasonable amount of life points could not be understated. Counter Fairy would also break into the top 16 here thanks mostly to Vandalkin the Dark Dragon Lord, a Shonen Jump promo from 2008 that could summon itself if you negate something with a counter trap, providing an insane amount of power behind your standard Counter Fairy game plan. Teledad had made an adjustment from its previous reckoning of a ban list, now opting for Summoner Monk lines to both access your hero engine with Stratos or to make easy level 8 synchros with Rose, who was a level 4 tuner. 
Drainbeat found revitalization here thanks to Beast King Barbaros, giving the deck easily the most powerful beater option to use under Skill Drain while other decks in the format suffer, adding in Floodgate options like Royal Oppression to back it up further. Lastly, a combination of the previous two strategies could be found in the first place spot for this event, piloted by Jeff Jones for his first major event victory, and this would not be his last. This particular build places a heavier focus on the Destiny Hero package for Dad thanks to Defender being a 2700 defense wall with no downsides under Skill Drain, and Fearmonger's effect being unaffected by the trap. Without question, the format had been shaken up heavily by these releases, and it was about to be broken up further, as the next core set aimed to take many of the themes pushed in the last month to their extremes and even beyond it to form a new meta environment. Raging Battle. Release date, May 12th, 2009. Set type, core set. Major strategies, Blackwings, Morphtronic, Koki Meru. Impact, The Rise of the Birds. Raging Battle, being the second core set of 2009, was expected to expand upon ideas established in Crimson Crisis before it, and in one particular way, it delivered in spades. That way was in further development of Blackwings, who received a major wave of support that would carve out the deck into a meta threat. This wave included Blizzard, a level 2 tuner who revived a level 4 lower Blackwing from Grave on summon, Shura, who summoned a 1500 or less attack Blackwing from deck when it destroys a monster in battle, Kalut, who could be discarded to boost a Blackwing's attack by 1400 that turn, Elfin, who can be normaled without tributes if you control the Blackwing and swapped an opponent's battle position when normaled, Armedwing, a level 6 synchro with piercing and gains 500 when attacking a defense monster, and the most important of all, Black Whirlwind, which adds a Blackwing from deck to hand with less attack than a Blackwing you normal summon. Between the ability to search swarming synchro pieces, attack modulate in the damage step like how light decks had done the past year, and being able to take advantage of the growing synchro pool better than any other deck, Blackwings were destined for meta success with this wave. On the other side of things, Morphtronic received another wave of support here in Vidion, who gains attack or defense for every equip spell on it, Scopin, a tuner that can either summon a level 4 Morphtronic from hand for synchro summons or make itself level 4, Power Tool Dragon, the boss monster of the strategy and cover card for the set, who can reveal three equip spells in deck once per turn to add one random one to hand, Double Tool CD, which could only equip to a higher level Morphtronic or Power Tool, giving it a thousand attack and effect negation on your turn and attack redirection on the opponent's turn, and Junk Box, which was a temporary monster reborn for the archetype. The deck was still heavily not meta, but with this support, the previous equip beatdown strategy seemed to solidify as the direction the deck would take moving forward. Although Power Tool Dragon became one of those cards that was an FTK enabler thanks to its very generic search of any equip spell. Earthbound Immortals were a new series of boss monsters that all shared the same ability to attack directly as well as the condition of being destroyed automatically if you controlled no field spell, all of which were considered remarkably bad. Kawaki Meru was a new archetype themed around a series of unusually powerful effects on monsters at the cost of either discarding an iron core of the Kawaki Meru each turn, or by revealing a monster of the same type in hand. While as an archetype this series would flop hard, various pieces from it would find their way into strategies focused around their attributes over time, specifically with Guardian for rocks and Drago for dragons out of this set, as their utility could be applied as long as you had a monster of that type in hand to reveal. Deep Sea Diva was a level 2 tuner that summoned a level 3 or lower Sea Serpent from deck on summon, intended to be used alongside Spined Gilman either as an offensive push of their own or for easy access to Sea Dragon Lord Gishilnadon, who gained attack anytime a level 3 or lower monster is sent to Grave while on field. Dragon Strategies would receive a couple of new tools in Lava Dragon, who acted like a pseudo rescue cat for dragons, requiring one target from hand and one from grave. Exploder Dragon Wing, who can destroy anything weaker than it that it battles to burn the opponent for that monster's attack, and Trident Dragon, who can destroy up to two of your own cards on summon to gain that many more attacks that turn, none of which would make a significant impact. One for one could send a monster from hand to grave to summon any level one from the deck, which was not too useful in this moment, but would eventually be one of the better synchro enablers in the format. Forbidden Chalice could negate a monster's effect that turn by making it gain 400, allowing use as either effect negation, a battle trick, or in the case of Drain Beat, both. Trap Stun was a new tool that prevented traps from activating that turn, which would see play in decks susceptible to battle traps like Gladiator Beast. Lastly, Snowman Eater was an OCG import that operated similarly to Raikou, popping a monster on field when flipped, 
with the trade-off being it could only pop face-up monsters as opposed to anything, had a stronger defense, and didn't mill when flipped. In the same period, we would also see a couple of video game releases with promos. The first of which was the Wii racing game Wheelie Breakers, which brought the Skull Flame series of cards, none of which would be useful and were forgotten just as fast as they came out. The other, and far more impactful, was the DS game Stardust Accelerator, which brought the first pieces of a new archetype known as Infernity, which all gained effects based on having no cards in hand, with this batch including Archfiend, Dwarf, and Guardian. Of these three, Archfiend was the only notable one, able to special summon itself if drawn into a hand with no other cards, and searched an Infernity card when special summoned with no cards in hand, which would become an integral piece of the strategy when the remainder of its cards eventually arrived. With these, we'd round out the month of May with no new tournament results, with the community really starting to feel the effects of the lack of competitive events, although some were just around the corner. Starter Deck 2009 Release Date June 6, 2009 Set Type Starter Deck Major Strategies X Saber Impact the cat is back. This year's starter decks had an interesting impact on the game as a whole that we really haven't seen out of a non-first of the era starter deck either before or since. And it entirely comes down to the inclusion of a single card, Xaber Airbellum. So for most who were looking at this year, Airbellum, alongside its siblings and the Xaber archetype, were not due out for us until November with Hidden Arsenal which would reprint the first set of dual terminal cards, even though the cards had not yet been released stateside, even in the dual terminal cabinets. Airbellum, Urbellum, and Gotham's Emergency Call were all printed here first, however, making them legal to use prior to the rest of the archetype, and honestly speaking, Airbellum was probably the best of them to release anyways because it was a level 3 beast tuner, making it summonable with Rescue Cat. In addition to this, it also hand-ripped a card from the opponent when it dealt battle damage, meaning summoning two with Cat in some situations could result in a massive hand-rip. This would be clearly seen with the European Championships a couple weeks later on June 27th, where a new deck found its way into the top cut in Cat Control, even taking the event piloted by Victorio Wichter, which aimed to use the various Cat targets like Air Bellum, Dark Panther, and Raikou to make synchro plays and generally control the game state alongside heavier control options like Cyber Valley. This would also, unfortunately, be the only Nationals level event with full coverage from this period, as many of the other standard National Scales events at the time are difficult to find full coverage for outside of the odd Top 16 deck list. With that said, there were a couple more releases between Euros and the World Championship, but with their content lineups, it was safe to assume nothing was going to change by then. Duelist Pack Yugi. Release date, July 7th, 2009. Set type, Duelist Pack. Major strategies, random cards Yugi played. Impact, reprinting a couple of cards. Duelist Pack Yugi was the first Duelist Pack ever to bring absolutely no new cards along with its release, purely being a collection of cards used by Yugi in the anime, which did allow the set to reprint a couple of cards that had only one or two printings prior to this, but nothing major beyond that. Notable reprints here included Marshmallow, The Gadgets, Brain Control, Exchange, Mirror Force, and Monster Reborn. This would be the entire legacy of this set, leading into the last pack before Worlds three weeks later. Retro Pack 2. Release date, July 28th, 2009. Set type, Reprint Set. Major strategies, the impactful promos of the last year. Impact, providing the EU with powerful promos. Retro Pack 2, similar to the first, was originally going to be an EU exclusive set, but was also released worldwide roughly a week later. But the primary impact this had was giving the EU player base access to a variety of cards that were only available as promos in the US that were otherwise illegal to play in the EU. Reprints here included Gores, Light and Darkness Dragon, and Green Baboon, alongside the first ever printing of Dragon Master Knight in the TCG, although this card was not impactful in the slightest. The 2009 World Championships would take place just over a week later on August 9th, and with it we'd see a powerful performance out of Gladiator Beast specifically, seeing Pure take 4 of the top 8 with an additional Cat variant to boot. However, 
Gladiator Beast would not win the day, as the event was taken by Benjamin Tai Hung Hui of Singapore playing Black Wings, playing Icarus Attack at its full three copies to take advantage of the swarming potential provided by the Black Wing effects. With this event in the books, Konami's takeover of the TCG was officially complete, which was marked by two specific events. The first of these was the first ever Turbo Pack, which took the place of the Champion Packs, given to official tournament stores to use as prizing for locals, and aimed at providing reprints to cards that were competitively viable and harder to get, with the first one reprinting Doom Caliber Knight, the previous SJC prize card, and Crush Card Virus, being its first printing since the Gold Series short prints. The second was the first SJC since April, being SJC Indianapolis, taking place on the same day on August 15th, and we'd see just how much the meta had changed since the previous SJC. Most of the faces here were identical to their showings in the previous European Championship with one major exception, being the rise in Salvo dad lists. Taking inspiration from the Salvo and Dekoichi inclusion in previous Blackwing lists, Salvo Dad aimed to mix the power of Dad decks with the explosive finish that was normal summon Salvo for Dark Strike Fighter, able to burn for severe amounts of damage thanks to the higher level darks you could play with. Philly Luna would take the event with Blackwings, marking his fourth SJC title, which would also mark his place in history as the player to win the most SJCs in the entirety of the game's history, as the tournament series would be discontinued in 2010 to make way for the YCS structure we know today. The final event of August this year was the release of the Collectible 10's 2009 Wave 1, which brought Power Tool Dragon and the upcoming Ancient Fairy Dragon as promos, which leads us to... Ancient Prophecy. Release date, September 1st, 2009. Set type, Core Set. Major Strategies, Blackwing, Fortune Lady, x Saber. Impact, laying the groundwork for future success. Ancient Prophecy was the third core set of the year, and while the meta wouldn't change rapidly from its releases like how the last couple of sets did, it would spawn a couple of new decks into the space thanks to a couple of specific cards. The first of these cards was Vayu the Emblem of Honor, which was the only Blackwing of note from this release, unable to be used for Synchro Summons normally, but was instead able to banish itself and one other Blackwing from Grave to cheat out a Blackwing Synchro with its effects negated. This would occasionally be splashed into Blackwings as a comeback option, but for the most part would be played in its own new deck known as Vayu Turbo, which took many cues from the previous dad lists loading up the grave with copies of Vayu and Sirocco using cards like Armageddon Knight and Dark Greffer to use Vayu's effect, able to summon out Armed Wing and eventually Armor Master by using Vayu with dead Armed Wings. The Fortune Ladies made their debut here too, a series of spellcasters whose attack is equal to their level times a multiplier and gained a level every turn, with Light being worth noting as she special summoned a Fortune Lady from deck if removed from the field by card effect. While this wouldn't be particularly good now, as the only target to summon with her effect was Fire, who popped a monster on special summon and burned the opponent, which wasn't the greatest payoff for the investment, the strategy would get better with time. Kawaki Meru saw a couple of new additions here with Boulder, who searched a Kawaki Meru monster or core on battle destruction, and Crusader, who searched a Kawaki Meru when it destroyed a monster in battle. Fishborg Blaster was a level 1 fish tuner, able to special summon itself from Grave by discarding a card while you control a level 3 or lower water monster. While not too great now, Fishborg Blaster would become a major piece of an FTK later in the era that would earn its current position on the ban list. x Saber received a couple of boosting support pieces here as a part of the XX Saber line in Faltrol, who could special summon himself if you control two x Saber monsters and could special summon an x Saber from Grave once per turn. Gotham's, a level 9 synchro that could tribute an x Saber to rep a card from the opponent's hand, and the TCG exclusive Full Helm Knight, a level 3 tuner who can negate an attack targeting an x Saber once while on field and revives an x Saber from Grave that destroys a defense position monster in battle. x Sabers would see serious experimentation from here thanks to the already popular performance of Air Bellum with Rescue Cat, but wouldn't break into the meta contention quite yet with this support. Flamvel Fire Dog would be the first of the upcoming Flamvel archetype, able to summon a fire monster with 200 defense from deck when it destroys something in battle, which was set up for the archetype's key spell Rekindling, which revives as many 200 defense fire monsters as possible. 
Fire Dog was recognizably good, but simply lacked a good target to summon at this time, but it would get one soon enough. Ancient Fairy Dragon was the cover card of the set and held a few utility effects, able to pop the active field spell to gain a thousand life points and search a new one, and could special summon a level 4 or lower monster from hand once per turn. At the time, this was considered one of the worst of the five signer dragons that 5Ds is named after, but would eventually, with changes in game design, become the absolute best. Ancient Sacred Wyvern was a new boss for light strategies, being a level 7 synchro that gained or lost attack equal to the difference between yours and your opponent's life points, able to push a lead much further if you were ahead, or being downright useless if you were behind, being one of the most win more cards ever. Solidarity was a new tool for beatdown decks specializing in a single type of monster, boosting the board by 800 attack if all monsters in grave were the same type, seeing some experimentation. Fossil Dig was effectively Rota for dinosaurs, which wasn't good now but would see play any time dinosaurs became meta-relevant. Lastly, Elemental Hero Gaia was an OCG import that could be splashed into hero beat decks to summon using Miracle Fusion, able to cut an opponent's attack in half and add that amount to Gaia's own attack until the end of the turn. Accompanying this pack, a new ban list was released the same day on September 1st, marking the end of cat format by hitting many of the pivotal pieces remaining in the meta. Newly banned were Dark Strike Fighter, being the first ban list since its release and shockingly being gone that fast, Card of Safe Return, which had overstayed its welcome at this point, Monster Reborn, as it was sort of collateral for a release later in the list, and Crush Card Virus, as the card had terrorized the format for far too long at this point. Newly limited were Black Rose Dragon, Blackwing Gale the Whirlwind, Demise, Mind Master, Rescue Cat, Summoner Monk, Cold Wave, Mind Control, One for One, Call the Haunted, and Solemn Judgment. Newly semi'd were Chaos Sorcerer, Lone Fire Blossom, Mizuki, and Bottomless. Lastly, unlimited were Breaker the Magical Warrior, Didi Warrior Lady, Green Baboon, Ryza, Destiny Draw, and Fissure. In addition to this, Shonen Jump would release a new promo card for the month of September, being Tragodia, a monster that can special summon itself when you take battle damage, similarly to Gores, gaining attack and defense for each card in your hand, can discard a monster once per turn to steal an opponent's monster of the same level, and can change its own level to match any monster in your graves once per turn. Tragodia was instantly experimented with thanks to being a pseudo Gores that you didn't have to have an empty board to summon, seeing play on and off throughout the era. SJC Orlando would be the first testing grounds for the new meta landscape on September 26th, and with it we'd see a new trend of the format. Light Sworn was the new top deck in town, as both Pure and Twilight variants would take the majority of top cut spots for this period of the game's history. Zombie Teledad was the newest pivot the deck took, combining the shell of what zombies were after the recent ban list with the Dad Core to form a fairly powerful deck that could take games shockingly fast with the right setup. Bayou Turbo would see its first top here, seeing mostly a Chaos Dad Core behind it, but also playing both Dimensional Alchemist and Burial from the Different Dimension to cycle used Bayous back into rotation, making it all the way up to second place at this event. First place would be claimed by Rodrigo Tagores on Black Wings, also choosing to tech in both Bayou as well as Dark Greffer to access the same Bayou Turbo line when needed. As sort of a more minor point, Ancient Prophecy Special Edition released on October 8th following this SJC. While up until now I've made little mention of the special edition sets, as they've been effectively the same pack as before with reprinted promos included, this time was slightly different, as the card being reprinted was Red Eyes Wyvern, which meant that now it was legally able to be played in US tournaments thanks to having a US legal printing. SJC Austin would follow this on October 17th, and we'd see similar results with Lightsworn and Twilight filling out the top ranks, although we'd also see a face we haven't seen in some time reappear. Chaos Control reappeared with two of the top 16 spots here, mostly thanks to the semi-limiting of Chaos Sorcerer making it possible to mix the previous dad core with some other light-focused staples like Dimensional Alchemist and Raikou to bolster the deck's strength. Chris Bowling would take first place here with Twilight, being his second major event title after the US Nationals the previous year, similarly taking advantage of the newly semi-ed Chaos Sorcerer to completely drop Dark Arm Dragon from the list. With Austin in the books, that leaves just three more set releases and one more SJC for 2009, and the next structure deck was sure to change something, just not in its own time. Warrior Strike. Release date, October 27th, 2009. Set type, structure deck. 
Major Strategies, Gemini. Impact, Useless in its time, Sleeper in retrospect. The Warrior Strike Structure deck is really an odd topic knowing what we know now about it. In its time, it was considered to be one of the worst structure decks of its era, bringing support to the Gemini subtype with Evocator Chevalier, Featherizer, Gemini Soldier, Hidden Armory, Phoenix Gearfreed, and Supervise. While not appreciated in its time, retro format lookbacks in the past year have actually discovered this structure deck may have been far more powerful than initially expected, mostly thanks to the interaction between Gemini Soldier and the trap Reinforced Truth from Ancient Prophecy able to quickly establish it with its effect to control the game state. Unfortunately, hindsight is 2020, so this will most likely be the last time we're talking about this deck for a really long time due to the stigma that Gemini is a bad mechanic. Which it is, it just wasn't as bad as people thought. Reprints in this time included Exiled Force, DD Warrior Lady, Cart Trooper, Mind Control, Burden of the Mighty, MST, Rhoda, and Dark Bribe, with some of these being the first easy access reprint they've received ever. This structure may have been forgotten in its time, but the set that directly followed by far would not be, as while many of its strategies fell flat, some of the staple synchros it brought would completely rule the game for years to come. Hidden Arsenal Release date, November 10th, 2009 Set type, Deck Building Set Major Strategies, Dual Terminal Wave 1 Impact, Revitalization of the Extra Deck Hidden Arsenal was the official pack release and legalization of the previously announced Dual Terminal exclusive cards. For those who are unfamiliar, Dual Terminal was an arcade-style cabinet that was originally debuted at Comic-Con in August of 2008, which aimed to do a fast-paced style arcade version of Yu-Gi-Oh!, rewarding a random card from its card pool to players for each playthrough. However, the cabinets were also slowly receiving their own unique storyline, known as the Dual Terminal series, which would occasionally debut cards early in the cabinets that would become legal upon their wide release later with the Hidden Arsenal packs. At this time, the first wave of Dual Terminal was a bit behind Hidden Arsenal's release, not being officially released until early 2010, so while the legality of cards wasn't an issue now, outside of a single card that it printed in a previous wave, it would become a more major point as we moved into 2010. In the meantime, Hidden Arsenal would bring with it six new archetypes to the game. However, these were archetypes we had actually already seen on and off at this point through their inclusion in other sets. Each of these archetypes spanned one of the six attributes and for the most part focused on their synchro boss monsters with a single exception. The first of these was Ice Barrier, water monsters primarily aimed at stunning out opponents to make their boss Bryonic Dragon of the Ice Barrier, a level 6 synchro that could discard cards to bounce that many cards from field to hand any number of times in a turn. This was the first of many synchros in the set to actually have powerful effects on a generic body, and there was no requirements to summon Bryonic or almost any of the synchro bosses here, meaning that practically all of them would see some form of extra deck staple play moving forward from here, with Bryonic being arguably tied for the most useful. The second archetype was Miss Valley, a series of wind monsters focused around bouncing cards to hand for swarming and effect usage. Their boss, Mist Worm, was a level 9 synchro requiring 3 materials that bounced up to 3 cards from field to hand on summon. While not quite as stable as Bryonic, Mistworm would see significant play as one of the biggest useful synchros you could make to swing a game in your favor. Next up were Flamvels, a series of fire monsters with 200 defense that we've actually already seen before with their cards Fire Dog and Rekindling in the previous core set. Their synchro, Iruquazaz, was a level 6 that dealt piercing, which wasn't quite as useful as its contemporaries, but more importantly, the set brought Flamvel Magician. While its effect meant literally nothing to an average player, as it's purely there for the lore of the dual terminal cards, what was important was that it was a level 4 fire tuner with 200 defense, meaning you could summon it with Fire Dog's effect to access a level 8 synchro in main phase 2, and make rekindling a free synchro summon later in the duel. This fact alone would have Magician see play for a period of time after this purely as one of the most reliable ways into Stardust Dragon. Following Flamvels were x Sabers, with their monsters Air Bellum and Er Bellum. Yeah, we've already seen these. x Saber kind of blew its load early by releasing its best cards in the year's starter deck, so unfortunately they received no new useful tools here. Following that disappointment was Ally of Justice, a series of dark machines that gained specific benefits when dealing with light monsters. 
which was so niche in its application that it was completely useless outside of one card of theirs that didn't have such a niche use. Ally of Justice Cataster was their Synchro Boss, a level 5 that destroyed any non-dark it battled, instantly becoming the end-all level 5 Synchro target in the game and being tied with Bryonic for the best card of the set. Lastly were the Worms, who didn't have a Synchro Boss and were a set of lackluster light reptiles that were either flip monsters or supported flip monsters, seeing no relevant play on release. SJC Columbus would take place less than a week later on November 14th, and a couple of changes were noticeable immediately. For starters, the hidden arsenal synchros had made their way into the meta without issue, seeing Cataster, Bryonic, or Mistworm show up in almost every extra deck in some capacity. Secondly, Zombie Teledad had a seriously powerful performance here, revitalizing the deck with cards like Diamond Dude to fuel card draw and Caius to form dark pushes with its banish effect. Diva Zombie would be a new face on the block here, able to use Diva to summon two level 2 tuners to the board to mix with your zombies to make quick and easy synchro pushes and climbs. Now able to make Bryonic with a Diva and a Zombie to bounce the board, then use Bryonic and a Diva to climb into a level 8 like Stardust or Red Dragon Archfiend. Vincent Rolambomi Adana would win the day with Twilight, opting for both Chaos Sorcerer and Dad Roots, but also notably playing 3 Tragodia to bolster his Dark Count, showing the power of this battle hand trap. This would be the last SJC of the year, as with the last core set of the year around the corner, the year would be coming to a close as the shiftings from the corporate side of the game slowed the development of the metagame around it. Stardust Overdrive Release date, November 17th, 2009 Set type, Core Set Major Strategies, Synchron, Fortune Lady, Reptilian Impact, nothing in the short term, a lot of one-offs for the long game. Stardust Overdrive was the final core set of 2009, and while it brought nothing to change the immediate future of the metagame, it brought so many one-off cards that would shape the near future of the game that it's hard to overlook. Quickdraw Synchron was a new tuner to add to the Synchron pool, able to consider itself any Synchron tuner for the summoning of a Synchro requiring one, but couldn't be used for any other Synchros. While at this point the Synchron Synchros weren't all that impressive, Quickdraw would grow more useful as more and more powerful Synchron Synchros emerged in the coming months. Level Eater was a level 1 that could summon itself from Grave by reducing the level of a 5 or higher monster by 1, which wasn't too useful now, seeing some play in Monarch strategies as a niche option, but would similarly grow stronger with time. Infernity Necromancer was another tool in the theoretical Infernity deck alongside the previously released promo Archfiend able to revive an Infernity from Grave once per turn if you had no cards in hand, but was still missing that X factor to make the strategy sing. Fortune Lady received a couple of good targets to summon with Light's effect in Water, who drew two cards on Special Summon, and Dark, who provided Grave Recursion, but neither would be good enough to make Fortune Lady viable outside of niche OTK strategies. Reptilian was a series of reptiles focused on dropping attack values to zero, but was so incredibly unfocused that it flopped hard on release. Swap Frog was the next in the line of theoretically good frog support, able to special summon itself by discarding a water, able to dump a water aqua from deck to grave on summon, and able to bounce a monster from field to hand once per turn to give you an additional frog normal summon. This one would be the frog to break them out of being purely theoretical, however, as Swap Frog provided both consistent board presence and grave setup to pair the frogs with monarchs, giving them the tribute fodder they needed to be good, spawning the deck of frog monarch from this combination. The Jin monsters would also release here, a series of fiends that could be banished from Grave to pay the cost of a Ritual Summon, giving that Ritual Summoned monster effects if used this way. Of these, the most notable one was Jin, Releaser of Rituals, who locked the opponent's special summons as long as her Ritual monster was on the field, which while inconsistent now would cause a severe headache in a few years. Blackwings received a new Synchro in Silverwind the Ascendant, who was a level 8 requiring 3 materials, killing its usefulness almost immediately, but it would see play simply as a level 8 target to summon with Vayu in Vayu Turbo decks. Gemini Spark was another piece of Gemini support, able to tribute off a Gemini to pop a card on field and draw a card. While this was intended to give Gemini decks more of a footing, what it actually did was give Hero Beat another push into the meta by creating a resource loop with Neos Alias allowing you to tribute a Neos Alias to pop a card and draw, then use Hero Blast to add the tributed Alias back to hand and pop an additional monster, turning Hero Beat into a serious meta contender. 
Preparation of Rites allows you to search for a level 7 or lower ritual monster and recur a ritual spell from grave to hand, seemingly built specifically to exclude Demise from this search to prevent another Demise OTK list. Because of this, Preparation of Rites would see no play in this short term period, but would become useful as a searcher for any future ritual strategies if the mechanic ever became useful. Stygian Dirge was an odd floodgate, dropping the level of all opponents' monsters by one, which was intended to block synchro spamming but was just mostly an inconvenience. It would, however, see play in later eras to block out other kinds of extra deck mechanics that were more rigid on their level requirements. A Pointer of the Red Lotus was a trap that could temporarily banish a card from the opponent's hand, which while not too useful now, as most decks were operating as a pseudo-toolbox of options, it would be useful as more and more decks move towards a more combo-oriented playstyle. Gateway of the Six was a TCG exclusive that gained two Bushido counters anytime you summoned a Six Samurai monster, then could remove counters from your side of the field to trigger an effect, with two getting you an attack boost, four getting you a search for a six samurai, and six letting you revive a sheen monster from the grave. While it wouldn't be too good now, as six samurai only really had one spam out option in Grandmaster, who could only have one copy on the field at a time, if six samurai ever got the ability to spam summon, this could become an issue really fast thanks to the lack of once per turns on it. Lastly, we have a few OCG import boss monsters that all have their own unique special summoning conditions being Dark Samorg, who could be special summoned from hand by banishing a Dark and Wind in Grave, or from Grave by banishing a Dark and Wind in hand, and prevented the opponent from setting cards. Arc Lord Christia, who could be special summoned if you had four fairies in Grave, adding one from Grave to hand on summon, lock special summoning for both players while on field, and place itself on top of the deck when sent to Grave, and Guardian Iados, who could special summon herself if you had no monsters in Grave, and could send an equip spell on her to Grave to banish up to three monsters from the opponent's Grave, gaining 500 attack for each. Of these, Christia and Iados would find some niche play, with Christia finding the occasional tech spot in some Lightsworn builds, and Iados finding a niche in Macro Drain decks as a free 2500 body since your Grave usually had no monsters in it. And with that, 2009 came to a close. All in all, the year itself was fairly uneventful on the surface due to the legal battle waging in the background, but this was simply the calm before the storm. As we entered into 2010, we'd find a wonderland of new playable strategies, a wasteland of new menaces, and the birth of the long-running mainstay of the competitive community. Entering 2010, and the halfway point of the era, the meta stood unchanged since the release of Hidden Arsenal near the end of 2009. While many cards that would be meta impactful were released in the last set of 2009, Stardust Overdrive, many of them were simply too early to be played in the capacity that they would be eventually. In addition to these, a few promos would drop to start the year off prior to the first SJC of the year, both being manga promos. The first of these was the Shonen Jump promo for January 2010, being an extremely important card for the game itself in a cultural sense, being the first legally playable copy of Obelisk the Tormentor. While the god cards had seen non-playable printings in the past, and even a set of them set for a major audience later this year, this was the first time any of them were playable in the game itself, with Obelisk requiring three tributes to summon, its summon both being unable to be negated and unrespondable, it being untargetable, and able to tribute two monsters to nuke the opponent's monsters, unable to attack the same turn, and destroyed at the end of the turn if it was special summoned rather than properly normal summoned. Obelisk would not see play at this point in time, but it was still noteworthy as it would lead to the remaining two god cards seeing legal printings over the next few years. The other was the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX Volume 4 promo, being Elemental Hero Absolute Zero, a fusion of any hero and a water, gaining 500 attack for all other waters on field and nuking the opponent's monsters when removed from the field. Absolute Zero was far more noteworthy than Gaia was, being easily the best hero fusion ever printed at the time, and was looked at because unlike all of the other elemental hero fusions, Absolute Zero could be made with any hero, which included Malicious, making it a consideration for some strategies to splash in Miracle Fusion. With these promos out, SJC Los Angeles would take place soon after the start of the year on January 9th, and with it we'd see similar results to the events at the end of last year, with Twilight and Lightsworn builds still dominating the meta, although not in an overwhelming sense. Diva Zombie was a good bit more successful following its top at the end of the previous year, seeing a shift towards more of a grave recursion package with a refocus on Book of Life. Steven Silverman would win the event with Lightsworn, 
seeing little to no difference to builds from the previous year with the sole exception of the inclusion of one copy of Arc Lord Christia. As while powerful, there were only six fairies in the main deck, so it was not a reliable win condition outside of beckoning light pushes. The first set of the year would come out at the end of the month and would slowly push in new cards to take advantage of the releases in Stardust Overdrive with the birth of a new powerful toolbox deck that would define the early months of 2010. Duelist Pack USA 2 Release date, January 26th, 2010 Set type, Duelist Pack Major Strategies, Synchron Impact, the beginning of the Synchron Toolbox Duelist Pack USA 2 would start the releases of 2010, and though it only brought one new relevant card, it would set the tone of every set of the year by bringing something of relevance to the table, no matter how small. For Yusei 2, that card would be Junk Archer, a level 7 synchro requiring Junk Synchron that can temporarily remove a threat from the opponent's board, returning it in the end phase. This would be the first of a couple of new cards to revitalize the previously released Quick Draw Synchron, who would over the coming months gain multiple new good synchro targets to summon using its replacement effect, which would go to spawn the Synchron Toolbox deck, which we'll go into more detail on in the coming sections. Reprints here would include the previously mentioned Quick Draw Synchron, Stardust Dragon Assault Mode, Debris Dragon, Lethal Eater, and One for One, which while not the greatest spread, still held powerful reprints. The set would set the stage for the coming weeks as the first core set of the year would release, and it would be the one to set the stage for one of the most heavily played retro formats in the modern day. Absolute Power Force Release date, February 16th, 2010. Set type, Core Set. Major Strategies, Gravekeepers, X Saber, Synchron. Impact, New Strategy Anchor Pieces. Absolute Power Force would be the first core set of the year, and while it may be considered the weakest of the four overall, that isn't to say it was bad in the slightest, as this set was incredibly powerful thanks to the introduction of a couple of powerful cards into the metagame. Starting with archetypes, Gravekeepers would get a wave of archetypal support here that was revolutionary for the time period, as while there had been the occasional support card for previous archetypes, this was one of the first major instances of legacy support in the game's history, with a legacy archetype from many years prior receiving a wave of support that revolutionized the strategy and brings it into the modern age. Gravekeeper support here included Descendant, who could tribute a Gravekeeper monster to pop a card on field, Visionary, who could be tribute summoned with only one Gravekeeper, gains 200 attack for each Gravekeeper in Grave, and can protect itself from destruction by discarding a Gravekeeper, Priestess, a TCG exclusive that treats the field as Necker Valley when there's no field spell active and boosts all Gravekeepers by 200 attack and defense, and Steel, which returns two Gravekeeper monsters from Grave to hand, ignoring the restrictions of Necker Valley. This wave would bring Gravekeepers into the modern age, specifically with Descendant, being a target to summon using Spy, who can then turn the Spy into Spot Removal, seeing splash play in multiple decks in the meta. Xaber would also receive another major upgrade here in Emmer's Blade, a TCG exclusive who summons an Xaber from deck when destroyed in battle, High and Lay, a level 6 synchro that pops up to 3 spells or traps on summon, and Saber Hole, which negates the summon of a monster if you control an Xaber. Xaber would be considered decent at this point as its own standalone deck thanks to the support, but wouldn't quite break into the meta yet, though it was almost there. Moving into more standalone pieces, Battle Fader was a new tool that let you special summon itself from hand to end the battle phase when attacked directly, being similar to Gores and Tragodia, filling a different niche and seeing considerable play with Monarch strategies in particular. Witch of the Black Rose drew a card on Normal Summon, discarding it and destroying herself if the drawn card was not a monster. She, alongside Gallus the Star Beast, would come together in the format to form a newer strategy known as Monster Mash, which was a collection of all of the good monsters in the format with no spells or traps to ensure their effects would always trigger. This particular deck at the time, though, would only appear over in the EU, as Gallus the Star Beast was still exclusive to the region and was unavailable in North America, making it illegal to play in NA events. Kokimeru Urn Knight was able to special summon a Kokimeru from deck by revealing an Iron Core in hand mostly seeing play for being a 2,000 attack body in Beast Warrior decks. Consecrated Light was an extremely targeted piece of sideboard hate, locking summoning and attacking of dark monsters while on the field, primarily sided against Black Wings at the time. Drill Warrior was the second big payoff target for Quick Draw Synchron, able to cut its attack in half to attack directly that turn and able to discard a card to put itself out of play until the next turn, returning a monster from grave to hand when it returned. 
Drill Warrior specifically would spark an innovation in the format in the deck of Quick Draw Dandy Warrior, which was mainly built on the interactions of Quick Draw Synchron and Dandelion, able to discard a Dandy to summon Quick Draw, then summon two fluff tokens with Dandy's effect, giving immediate access to either Drill Warrior to push advantage or to Junk Archer to clean up games. This particular strategy would go on to define the game for a few months after release, which we'll cover soon enough. Cards of Consonance allowed the user to discard a Dragon Tuner to draw two cards, which was not too useful yet as the only Dragon Tuner at this stage seeing play was the occasional Debris Dragon, which was not a common enough occurrence to justify its inclusion in deck building. Fiendish Chain was the newest staple trap, being a continuous trap that attached itself to a monster, negating its effects and preventing it from attacking, seeing little play at first but would grow into an integral part of the format. Super Nimble Mega Hamster was a TCG exclusive that, when flipped, summoned a low-level beast from deck in face-down defense position, specifically useful for summoning Raikou out of the deck to use its pop and mill effect. Lastly, Gale Dogra was an OCG import that, by paying 2,000 life points, let you send monsters from the extra deck to the graveyard. At this point, it wouldn't be useful at all, but would eventually find use as extra deck monsters gain more and more interactive graveyard effects. With this release, the stage was being set for a major format shift, complemented by the structure deck following just a week later. Machina Mayhem. Release date, February 23rd, 2010. Set type, Structure Deck. Major strategies, Machines. Impact, Ma China. Machina Mayhem was the first Structure Deck in a long time to actually be focused on an archetype rather than just generically good support for their monster type or subtype. Though you could still easily make an argument for both in the camp of either Machine or Unions. Its primary three new monsters, Machina Fortress, Gearframe, and Peacekeeper, are some of the best machines printed up until this point, with Gearframe and Peacekeeper being arguably the best unions too, although you would almost never play them for their union effects. Peacekeeper lets you add a union monster from deck to hand when destroyed, which can include while it's equipped to a monster, Gearframe searches a Machina on normal summon, and Fortress, their boss, was an extremely unique monster to say the least. As part of its summon condition, you can either summon it from hand or grave by discarding at least 8 levels of machines from the hand, which technically meant that if it was in hand, you could summon it by discarding itself and any other machine, as its summon condition can summon itself from the grave or hand, leading to the strategy's popularity. It also had the added effects of destroying another card on field when destroyed in battle, and ripping a card from the opponent's hand when targeted by a monster effect, both of which were incredible effects for the time. In addition to these, the structure also gave us Scrap Recycler, who on summon can send a machine from deck to grave and can shuffle two Earth level 4 machines from grave into deck once per turn to draw a card. Recycler wouldn't see much play on release, but it is worth noting as the ability to bend a machine on summon would come up in later eras of the game. Machina would eventually go from here to be a major piece of the format, primarily only being held back by its typing of machine, as any player could contest the deck's end board simply by summoning a Cyber Dragon to fuse their board into Chimera Tech Fortress Dragon. But notably, this wouldn't be a factor for the time in the EU, as Fortress Dragon, being a jump promo, was still unavailable in the region. Reprints this go-round included Cyber Dragon, ironically, The Gadgets, Cyber Valley, Dimensional Prison, and Compulse, being much lighter than the other Structure Deck releases. SJC Nashville would take place four days later on February 27th, and while it might seem like the format had diversified substantially with this event, it was primarily centralized around different Lightsworn and Zombie decks at this point, as the power of both Lightsworn and Zombie cores were omnipresent at this stage. Going into some of the more unique outings here that we haven't seen so far, Spaceship was an odd one-off deck in the top 16, using the interaction of the various spaceship monsters like Victory Viper XX03 and Lord British Space Fighter with Honest, who could push their battle-centric effects to their natural breaking point. Xaber would see a single top here thanks primarily to its new support from Absolute Power Force in addition to its already present Rescue Cat synergies. Able to summon two Air Bellum from deck to get board presence to go off with their other swarming cards like Fall Troll and Gotham's Emergency Call. Satoshi Kate would take the event with Phantom Twilight Zombie, combining the already popular Twilight Zombie from the end of 2009 with Phantom of Chaos, who could copy the effect of Sky Scourge Norlaris to nuke the board and take over with your engrave effects like Mizuki. This event would be the straw that broke the camel's back in a way, as four days later on March 1st, the ban list was updated with many hits across the board. Newly limited were Bryonic, Chaos Sorcerer, Lumina, Mizuki, Necroface, Necrogardna, Tragodia, Allure of Darkness, Burial from a Different Dimension, Charge of the Light Brigade, 
Destiny Draw, Foolish Burial, Magical Explosion, and Mind Crush, with many of these hits targeted at Light Sworn and Zombie specifically. Newly semi-limited were Cyber Dragon, Dandelion, Demise, Honest, Treeborn Frog, Black Whirlwind, United We Stand, Royal Decree, Royal Oppression, and Skill Drain. Lastly, Unlimited were Mask of Darkness and Smashing Ground. With these changes, both Lightsworn and Twilight variants would take major hits in their counts of Lumina, Necrogardena, and Charge, with the Zombie variant also taking a major hit in both Mizuki and Burial, seeing the decks fall in placement rather quickly from these hits. Following this change, a couple of new promo releases would occur that would be pretty impactful. The first of these was a promo in the Duelist Pack Collection 10 2010, which brought the trap Starlight Road, able to negate any effect that would destroy two or more cards you control, summoning a Stardust after the fact. This would become a solid option for many decks in the format, able to negate popular swing cards like Heavy Storm and Judgment Dragon, which not only outs a major issue, but also puts Stardust on the board to potentially negate a future issue, though notably the Stardust summoned this way would not be able to revive thanks to it not being properly summoned the first time. The other promo release here would be the Absolute Power Force Special Edition, which brought reprints of both Dandelion and Red MD, making them not only accessible, but also legal for the EU due to being jump promos prior to this. With that said, the stage was set for a new format to take hold, and the release directly after would probably not change anything about that fact. Duelist Pack Kaiba. Release date, April 20th, 2010. Set type, Duelist Pack. Major strategies, random cards that Kaiba played. Impact, potentially a catalyst for retro play. Duelist Pack Kaiba, similarly to Yugi the previous year, brought next to no new cards to the game with the exception of a single new card in the form of Malefic Blue-Eyes White Dragon as a way to tie the TCG in with the upcoming Bonds Beyond Time movie. Because of this, the pack itself was primarily filled with different cards used by Kaiba in the anime, which was also a point of note as Kaiba's cards were always the more powerful of the time, meaning that many of them at this stage were already banned in the TCG. These reprints include Cyberjar, who was banned, CED, who was banned, Pot of Greed, which was banned, Ring of Destruction, which was banned, and Crush Card Virus, which was banned. What it did do, however, was reprint a lot of staple cards from the formats of late 2004 and early 2005, which alongside other reprint releases of those eras found later in this year and into the next, could be considered a catalyst of sorts for the wider Yu-Gi-Oh! community that led to the eventual creation of what is referred to now as GOAT format in early to mid-2012. It's a little ironic, of course, that the catalyst that potentially led to the creation of one of the most popular retro formats of all time happened here, as five days after this set release would be the last SJC ever held and the event that immortalized the other most popular retro format of Yu-Gi-Oh! SJC Edison was held on April 25th, and this would be the final SJC ever, as Konami was retiring the circuit following the full takeover of the TCG from Upper Deck, already assuring the community that a new tournament series would be replacing the SJCs in the coming months. Edison would not only show a completely new format to the previous metagame, but would also prove to be a time capsule of sorts. As with modern day hindsight, Edison format is one of the most unsolved formats of its era, with so many innovations to it coming out over the coming decades. As for the tournament itself, as previously mentioned, a variety of innovations to the format would come out of this event, so let's take a look through these new decks. Gravekeeper Burn would be sort of a precursor to events later this year, with the Gravekeeper package of Spy, Descendant, Guard, and Commandant facilitating a wave motion cannon win condition. Playing various stall tools like Level Limit, Messenger of Peace, and Skill Drain, alongside the ability to rip the opponent's hand apart with Royal Tribute. Gladiator Beast would take two top spots here with two different approaches, the first being a more low to the ground, back row heavy strategy taking heavy advantage of the various options in the format, and the other being a more combo oriented take with Cat and Sam Knight in tow. Machina would make its first major event appearance here thanks to the gadgets constantly providing hand resources for fortress plays. Backed up even more by Solidarity bringing your machine's attack values higher and higher. The primary reason that this didn't end up higher than top 16 though was probably because of Cyber Dragon, which had already found its way into various players' side and main decks to counter out such a bold strategy. Lightsworn and Twilight would both find showings here following their nerfs, with Pure going heavier on the Fairy count for Christia access, and Twilight pulling more into the Dark count by effectively only playing a handful of Lightsworns, notably playing Hamster in the main to serve as a fourth copy of Raikou. 
Blackwing would see a bit of hybridization to the previous playstyles here, being primarily the pure variant with easy access to level 6, 7, and 8 synchros and Dark Arm Dragon pushes, but also now playing two copies of Vayu to serve as a way to manipulate their Dark Count and Grave to access quick advantage swings. There would also be one instance of Light Sword Monarch in the top cut here, with a pivot back to Thestalos alongside Caius for the Monarch lineup, similarly playing Hamster as a way to access Raikou. Flamvel would see its first real success here thanks to Fire Dog, Magician, and Rekindling, able to access and abuse the level 8 Synchro Pool better than any other deck with both Gravekeeper and Raikou engines backing up their advantage. Cat Control would see two top spots here thanks primarily to the control provided by a splashed-in Gravekeeper engine, able to capitalize on a flipped spy with two air bellum, proving to be a powerful strategy. Doom Caliber Gadget is an anomaly even today, as Edison historians still have little to no idea how this deck made it all the way to second place at this event. But the core concept of the deck is to take advantage of the control provided by Doom Caliber Knight alongside the resource engine of the gadgets to take games long and win through sheer control of the game state. Jeff Jones would win the event here with Quick Draw Dandy Warrior, with his deck taking full advantage of the previously mentioned Quick Draw and Dandelion combo, also playing two copies of Lone Fire Blossom to both access Dandelion as well as Titanial on demand. This particular event would be remembered fondly by the community both for its diversity and its brevity, as it was the only event played in this criminally short-lived format, as the next set releasing two weeks later would bring about so many new power strategies to the game that the game itself would take a massive leap forward that hasn't been seen since Duelist Genesis. The Shining Darkness Release date, May 11th, 2010 Set type, Core Set. Major strategies, X Saber, Infernity, Frog. Impact, massive leaps with horrid consequences. The Shining Darkness is one of the sets of the 5Ds era that arguably changed the most about the game with its release by itself, specifically in the introduction of support for three previously talked about archetypes that would, effectively, warp the entire game around their support here which would sadly render many of the metagame advancements that we just saw in the last SJC completely moot. The three in question come down simply to the archetypes of X-Saber, Infernity, and Frogs, each of which change fundamental aspects of the game here with their new support. Starting with X-Saber, they receive Bogart Knight, a TCG exclusive that, on normal summon, summoned an X-Saber from hand. Dark Soul, a TCG exclusive that, on the turn it sent from field to grave, let you search an X-Saber from deck at the end phase, and Pashal, an OCG import that can't be destroyed by battle, dealing damage to the user every turn it remains in face-up defense. X-Saber with this support would rapidly rise in the meta, as now you had both better board swarming to enable fall troll, better searching, and more adjustable levels for synchro summoning, making swarming to hand rip with Gotham's a far more common occurrence. A major point of note here was specifically in the case of Dark Soul, whose text on release was not entirely clear how it specifically worked, causing a rulings nightmare for major events following its release where you would get a search in the end phase for every time it was sent from field to grave that turn, meaning that players could constantly revive him, tribute him with Gotham's for a hand rip, and repeat, getting a search for every time you did so. This instance would arguably be the cause of the creation of what became known as problem-solving card text, or PSCT for short, being implemented a year later, as the confusion from rulings that came off of this were devastating for major events, although the cause as to why the shift occurred has never been officially stated. The second archetype was Infernity, which saw a larger wave of support to provide them with access to the Synchro Pool with Mirage, who can't be summoned from Grave and can send itself to Grave while you have no cards in hand to revive two Infernities, Beetle, who can tribute himself if you have no cards in hand to summon two more from deck, Avenger, who can summon itself from Grave when a monster is destroyed while you have no cards in hand, copying that monster's level, Doom Dragon, a level 8 synchro that can destroy a monster the opponent controls and burn them for half its attack once per turn if you have no cards in hand, Launcher, who can send an Infernity from hand to Grave once per turn and can be sent from field to Grave to revive two Infernities, and Barrier, a TCG exclusive Omni Negate counter trap that requires you to have no cards in hand and control an Infernity monster. With this support alongside the previously released Archfiend and Necromancer, Infernity became one of the end-all be-all combo decks of the upcoming meta, as you could effectively loop almost infinite resources by repeatedly summoning Archfiend, then removing it from the field using a Synchro Summon, resummoning it through one of the many methods to get another search. This looping of resources is arguably why hard once returns would come into the design space shortly hereafter, 
where an effect usage is tied to the card name rather than being once per copy, with Infernity being one of the first true abusers of the soft once per turn clause. Third and final here would be Frogs, who received only one piece of new support here with Ronin Toten, but oh what a piece of support it was, able to revive itself from Grave by banishing any frog in Grave. This would be the piece to break Frogs out of just another engine and into the range of an FTK deck, as while it wouldn't immediately be recognized as such, Frog FTK would quickly become one of the most consistent FTKs in the entire game's history, which we'll cover soon enough. As for other cards here, the fillouts didn't slouch either, bringing some absolutely stellar support for various strategies. Spore was a level 1 plant tuner that could revive itself once per duel by banishing another plant in Grave, gaining its level in addition to its own. While not immediately impactful, Spore would move to be one of the premier tuners in the later stages of the 5Ds era alongside its sister card later this year. Watts were a new archetype of little monsters that primarily focused on control effects triggered by attacking, with our primary piece here being Watt Giraffe, which can attack directly and locks all opponent's effects for the rest of the turn after dealing battle damage. Kokimeru Sandman was another powerful rock piece for Kokimeru, being the same as Guardian before it, just for traps instead of monster effects. Testudo Erat Numen was an odd floodgate of a monster, locking summoning monsters with 1800 or more attack, which for the time wouldn't be played but would eventually see experimentation in the far off future. Battery Man Fuel Cell was yet another piece to try and bring Battery Man into the meta, able to special summon itself if you control two Battery Men, able to tribute a Battery Man on field to bounce an opponent's card to hand. While it was interesting to give Battery Man another larger swarm body, Battery Man would still not be a viable strategy here. Herald of Perfection was a level 6 ritual monster that could, by discarding a fairy, negate and destroy anything that activates an effect being easily the most powerful ritual monster made up until this point. But with the mechanics still being so clunky, it would only see minor success at this stage. Blackwings would receive an odd draw spell and cards for Black Feathers, which lets you banish a Blackwing in hand to draw two, but lock special summoning for the turn, being a far worse version of Allure of Darkness for the strategy. Into the Void was technically meant as Infernity support, able to draw a card if you have three or more cards in hand and requiring to discard the hand at the end of the turn but this would primarily go on to be simply more of an FTK and OTK draw power. Chaos Trap Hole was the new counter trap option to stop light and dark decks, able to pay 2000 life points to negate the summon of a light or dark monster and banish it. Lastly, Gen X would be a new archetype imported from the OCG, being centralized around Gen X controller, with most pieces using controller in some way to trigger their effects, such as Undyne, able to send a water from deck to grave to add controller from deck to hand, or Gen X Neutron, who searched a machine tuner from deck to hand at the end of the turn it summoned. Four days after this set release would be the true testing grounds for the new meta game, being the first ever Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series, or YCS, being Konami's replacement for the SJC circuit up until this point, also introducing three new prize cards at the same time, being Dark Lords Asmodeus, Superbia, and Eda Ere, adaptations of Professor Hibiki's cards from the GX manga. YCS Washington DC would be the break-in tournament, taking place on May 15th, and with it we'd see massive shifts in the metagame towards the strategies from the previous set release. Taking a look into the newer decks present here, Harold would see a singular top here, primarily abusing draw power provided by Tethys Goddess of Light to continually draw fairies from your deck. Xaber had a particularly powerful showing here thanks to the new swarming options the deck gained from Shining Darkness, especially since the deck could effectively hand rip the opponent and completely refuel thanks to Gotham's and Dark Soul. Rescue Cat was once again pulling a lot of work here thanks to Dark Soul also being a beast, meaning Cat could now summon both Air Bellum and Dark Soul to Synchro Summon High and Lay and set up a Dark Soul trigger, being exceptionally powerful. Infernity was one of the more notable breakout successes here, able to effectively loop through as many resources as you need to end on an end board of Doom Dragon and a number of back row, which would shift over the course of the format to include more and more Infernity Barrier. Peter Chang would take the day on Machina Gadget, notably playing Overdragon and Future Fusion lines to dump copies of both Jinzo and Returner from the deck to set up massive one-turn pushes. This would stand as the debut for the Nationals format as we entered the month of June, with only a couple more cards to be added into the format with the year starter deck two weeks later. Starter Deck Duelist Toolbox Release Date June 1st, 2010. Set Type, Starter Deck. Major Strategies, Synchron, x -Saber. Impact, Another Quick Draw Target. Duelist Toolbox would be, for the most part, a standard yearly starter deck, bringing a couple of new cards to play with in the meta. 
The primary new addition here would be Junk Destroyer, a level 8 synchro requiring Junk Synchron that can destroy cards on the field up to the number of non-tuners used to summon him, being an excellent new target for Quick Draw Synchron, giving him now a viable level 6, 7, and 8 target to summon. Xaber Wayne would also be released here, being a level 5 synchro that summons a level 4 lower warrior from hand on summon, being a decent inclusion for Xabers in the format. Lastly was Synchron Explorer, who revives a Synchron on normal summon, being a tech choice for the quick draw decks in the format. As for reprints, the deck included copies of Junk Synchron, Quick Draw Synchron, Giant Trunade, Card Destruction, Rhoda, Econ, and Urbellum, being a small burst, but above average for the standard starter deck reprints. YCS Chicago would take place almost three weeks later on June 19th, and Xaber would move into an absolutely dominant position from this tournament, although it would be also the first appearance of the true problem deck of the format. That deck was Frog FTK, which would only grab a top 32 spot here, but would grow into an absolute menace. The basic idea is to get Substitute and any other monster onto the board with Mass Driver, able to tribute off other monsters repeatedly with Substitute to summon every frog out of your deck with Swap Frog also being able to dump the Roden Totens and Fishborg Blaster this way. From there, you continuously summon back either Ronin Totem or Fishborg Blaster by banishing Frogs and Grave and discarding the other cards in your hand to tribute off with Mass Driver, which will burn the opponent to death after 20 tributes. This particular strategy was deceivingly consistent, as the only non-searchable piece in the entire deck was Mass Driver, which became simple to access when you're milling 70% of your deck before beginning to draw. While it was not successful in going far here, the idea had been successfully planted into the minds of the player base, and unfortunately it would only fester from here. Omar Belden would win the event with Infernity, trimming the monster count down to 14 to prevent drawing too many early in addition to upping the count of Infernity Barrier to 3, recognizing the power of 3 Barrier on turn 1. The format was rapidly approaching the national season, with only one set released between here and there, and the next set wouldn't bring any new cards, so the format was clear to develop into its final form in the coming months. Gold Series 3 Release Date June 23rd, 2010 Set Type Reprint Set Major Strategies Staples of the previous year's meta Impact lowering the price ceiling substantially. Gold Series 3, being the third pass at the yearly reprint set series, would follow in the footsteps of the previous year by reprinting various power cards from the previous year, being the first Gold Series to also include Synchro Monsters. Reprints this year would include Destiny Hero Malicious, Nova Summoner, Goblin Zombie, Elemental Hero Prisma, Dimensional Alchemist, Judgment Dragon, Mizuki, Plague Spreader Zombie, Thunder King Ryo, Blackwing Gale, Bora, Sirocco, Blizzard, Shura, Kalut, Armor Master, Armed Wing, Black Whirlwind, Infernity Archfiend, Stardust Dragon, MST, Smashing Ground, Enemy Controller, Destiny Draw, and Icarus Attack, with this set being the first Gold Series to not reprint a previous SJC prize card. The national season would begin with the South American World Championship Qualifier, or WCQ as we will refer to it going forward taking place on June 26th, and the results from this event would show clearly that the genie was out of the bottle in the case of Frog FTK, taking three top spots and winning the event piloted by Juan Pablo. Aside from this, the meta actually stood rather balanced, with a fair showing out of Infernity, X-Saber, Gladiator Beast, and Black Wings in a couple of other one-off decks. The US WCQ would follow two weeks later on July 10th, and X-Saber would have an absolutely dominating performance here, taking over half the top 32 and the first place slot piloted by Sean Matog. Aside from the dominance of X-Saber, the meta once again stood diverse with 11 other decks in the top 32. The Canadian WCQ took place the same day, and we'd see a similar spread to the US WCQ, although interestingly not a single X-Saber list would clear past the top 16, with all five falling out prior to top 8. We would only see one additional deck here that we haven't seen before in the top cut, being Diva Hero, which operated similarly to the previous Diva Zombie, subbing out the zombie engines with a small core of heroes, with Stratus, two Malicious, and a new inclusion of Infernal Prodigy, who can special summon itself to either provide synchro material with Diva or tribute fodder for Caius. This deck primarily came about thanks to the release of Absolute Zero, who could be summoned using D.Va and any of the previously mentioned hero pieces, providing an incredibly powerful burst of power out of nowhere. Aaron Noel would take the event with Infernity, playing the standardized variant at this stage with Triple Barrier for the most powerful turn 1 setup possible. 
the EU Championship would take place a week later, and we'd see similar results to the other WCQ events in the same period. Anti-Meta Stun would be the only unusual deck in the top cut here, using various stun monsters to control the game like King Tiger Wonghu, Doom Caliber Knight, and Fossil Dyna Pachacephalo. Rodrigo de Gores would take the event, claiming a second major event victory using Frog FTK, with the deck becoming more and more streamlined by the day, only playing a single card now that is not either part of the FTK engine or a draw tool. This would mark the end of the national season, with Xaber being positioned as the top deck in terms of representation, but not in terms of event victories, leaving the format up in the air as the next set would attempt to shake up the volatile meta. Hidden Arsenal 2. Release date, July 20th, 2010. Set type, deck building set. Major strategies, dual terminal wave 2. Impact, control powerhouses for future scenarios. Hidden Arsenal 2 was the official release of the second wave of the dual terminal cards, which have had their dual terminal distribution at this stage, but this would mark the official release and legalization of these cards. The set's primary goal was to build out the lore of the dual terminal series by both supporting the previously released archetypes and establishing new ones. Support would be doled out here for Ally of Justice and Worm, with neither having any impact on the meta at large. Ice Barrier would receive Doloran, a level 6 Waterlock Synchro that could bounce any number of face-up cards you control to hand to boost its attack by 500 once per turn, being a soft once per turn on release. While Doloran would not see nearly the widespread play that Bryonic had saw before it thanks to the Waterlock, it would be used in the future as an OTK enabler thanks to the targeted self-bounce on a soft once per turn. Miss Valley would receive a couple of new power cards here in Falcon, a 2000 attack level 4 that could attack by bouncing a card you control to hand, and Apex Avian, the boss monster of Miss Valley, able to bounce a Miss Valley from field to hand to negate any card or effect once per chain. Both of these would find their place in various decks, with Falcon finding a home in stun decks and Avian finding a home in later formats as a major boss for certain decks to take advantage of thanks to it being able to bounce itself to negate cards. Flamvel would receive Baby, whose effect is completely irrelevant to its usage, simply being a level 1 tuner summonable by Fire Dog and Rekindling, seeing play for that reason. As for the new to Hidden Arsenal archetypes, Naturia was a series of Earth beasts, insects, plants, and other various types, focused on control gameplay by restricting what the opponent can do. Their boss monster, Naturia Beast, was a level 5 Earthlock Synchro that could mill two cards from the top of your deck to negate any spell any number of times a turn. Naturia as an archetype would go absolutely nowhere with this wave. However, Beast specifically would be picked up by decks able to provide the Earth materials for it, able to shut down a large portion of the opponent's deck with its effect. Gen X would receive new support here after its debut in Shining Darkness, with its most notable piece here being Blast Fan, able to search a dark Gen X on Special Summon, which would see some minor experimentation as a swarm tool. Fabled would be a new archetype of Light Fiends focused on discard effects, receiving Grimrow, who can send itself from hand to grave to search a Fabled monster if you control a Fabled, Kushano, who can discard a Fabled in hand to add itself from grave back to hand, and Valkyris, a level 8 Fable-locked Synchro that could discard a Fiend to draw a card once per turn. Fable would see minor experimentation here, but no success until future waves of support were released. Lastly were the Jurax, a new series of fire dinosaurs with a mishmash of random effects at the time, seeing no play on release. YCS Indianapolis would follow this release two weeks later on August 7th, with the only real contribution from Hidden Arsenal 2 to the meta being the inclusion of Naturia Beast into X Saber Extra decks, being makeable using Poshul. Anthony Meyer would take the event using Anti Meta Stun, whose deck, like previous variants, was built specifically for countering out X Saber, Infernity, and Frog FTK with its options. Directly following Indy, the 2010 Yu Gi Oh! World Championships would take place in Long Beach, Florida on August 14th. And with it, Blackwing would have a shocking upset of placements in the top 8, taking 3 of the top 8 spots. However, one of the biggest red flags in the game's history was the winning deck, being Galileo de Abaldia of Panama's Frog FTK, being the first and so far only time in the game's history that an FTK deck took the world championship, which 100% put the deck as enemy number 1 on the next ban list. While the meta had stagnated the last few months, Changes to the game as a whole were on the horizon, as the next core set was 10 days away, and judging by the core sets so far, it was bound to bring a massive shakeup to the game as a whole. Duelist Revolution Release date, August 17th, 2010 Set type, Core Set 
Major Strategies, Scrap, Amazonas, Synchro Fusions. Impact, a power leap to define an era. Duelist Revolution, being third in a year of highly impactful core sets, would bring a wave of new stables to the game, being heralded by many in the community as the largest jump in generic power from the 5Ds era. While its number of impactful cards is arguably lower than that of Shining Darkness before it, the difference stood in while Shining Darkness introduced strong decks to the game, Duelist Revolution introduced powerful staples for any deck to use. There are three cards in particular that would come from this set that would become immediate staples and change many aspects of card design for the game forever. The first of these was Effect Veiler, a level 1 tuner that can be discarded from hand on the opponent's turn to negate the effects of a face-up monster they control. Veiler would be the first in a new powerful line of hand traps that would slowly release through the remainder of 5Ds, and would revolutionize the concept following the previous hand traps being odd one-offs in the case of DD Crow, or battle-centric in the cases of Gores and Tragodia, with Valor moving from here to become staple in various decks of the format as a form of turn 1 interaction. The second was Pot of Duality, a spell that, for the cost of special summons that turn, let you look at the top 3 cards of your deck, pick one to add to hand, and shuffle the other two back in. Duality would represent a trade-off for the era that was exceptionally well-balanced, allowing for more consistency in exchange for not popping off that turn, which would see play as a 3-of in almost every deck in the format, as the consistency it provided was well worth the trade-off. It would also serve as a blueprint for various cards designed many years from now as examples of making good consistency cards that had an appropriate drawback. Lastly of the staple trio was Solemn Warning, a counter trap that can negate a summon or affect that summons for the cost of 2,000 life points. At this stage, Solemn Judgment was already seeing consistent play primarily as a way to counter out the inherent summons of various bosses and synchros, so giving the players the ability to do the same for simply 2,000 life points rather than potentially 4,000 would be immediately jumped on, with Warning taking a slot in most decks back row lineups immediately at its maximum 3 copies. Outside of these 3 cards, there were still plenty of other cards in the set to experiment with, starting with the new archetype of Scraps, a series of earth monsters that gain effects when destroyed by card effect, with Chimera summoning a scrap tuner from Grave on normal summon, Goblin being unable to be destroyed in battle, destroying itself at the end of the battle phase if attacked in face-up defense, and adding a scrap from Grave to hand if destroyed by a scrap effect, including its own. Beast, with the same auto-destroy and cycle effect as Goblin, Golem, who could special summon a scrap from Grave to either player's field once per turn, Archfiend, a TCG exclusive level 7 synchro with no effect, Dragon, a level 8 synchro that could destroy a card on each player's field once per turn and revive a non-synchro scrap on effect destruction, Yard, a search spell for scrap tuners, and Storm, a foolish burial for scraps that destroys a scrap on your field and draws a card. Scrap as a strategy would see the occasional pop up into the meta with this introductory wave, but by far and away their biggest impact would be in Scrap Dragon, who was shockingly a generic synchro, becoming one of the staple level 8s of the format. Watts would see a couple of new pieces here with Pheasant, who could attack directly and temporarily banish a monster on field when it deals battle damage, and Chimera, a level 6 Watt Locked Synchro that could attack directly and stacks a card in the opponent's hand on top of their deck if it dealt battle damage. Watts would see the occasional experimentation at this stage thanks to its multiple direct attackers, but still would see no meta play from this. Naturia would see a couple of support pieces released here, with the notable ones being Bamboo Shoot, who locked the opponent from using spells and traps if it was tribute summoned using a Naturia monster, and Pineapple, a TCG exclusive that operated like Treeborn Frog, but only if you only have plants and beasts in Grave. This package would see some minor experimentation in the meta, with Pineapple seeing a massive amount of hype on reveal to release, but the package itself would not crack into the meta at all. Amazonas would be the next legacy archetype after Gravekeeper to receive a major redefining support wave with Sage, who could destroy a spell or trap after she attacks, Trainee, who sends a monster she destroys to the bottom of the deck, Queen, who prevents Amazonas monsters from being destroyed by battle, and Scouts, a TCG exclusive that could tribute itself on quick effect to prevent Amazonas monsters from being targeted by monster effects or destroyed by card effects. While this was not quite as good as the previous Gravekeeper wave, it did set the precedent that legacy support was now going to be a regular thing for older archetypes. Synchro fusions were a new concept of fusing synchro monsters together to make stronger bosses, which was primarily supported by the spell Miracle Synchro Fusion, able to banish the materials from Grave to fuse if the fusion requires a synchro monster, with the concept doing absolutely nothing on release. Horn of the Phantom Beast was a trap that boosted a beast or beast warrior by 800 attack and drew a card every time it destroys a monster in battle, seeing some consideration for various stun decks as their primary playmakers were beast and beast warriors at this stage. Lastly for OCG imports, 
Fabled Raven could discard any number of cards to boost its level and attack for each until the end of the turn, seeing play in a future strategy, and Stygian Street Patrol, who could banish itself from Grave to special summon a fiend with 2,000 or less attack in hand, which would become a tech option for Infernity for summoning an Archfiend in hand to trigger its effect. In addition to Duelist Revolution's release, a new ban list would take effect two weeks later on September 1st, and it would swiftly deal with many of the problem cards of the era. Newly banned were Rescue Cat, Substitute, Brain Control, Heavy Storm, and Temple of the Kings. With Cat and Toad being power players of two of the top decks, Xaber and Frog FTK, Brain Control and Heavy Storm being staples of the format, and Temple of the Kings being a preemptive hit to an upcoming release, being the first time in the history of the game that a card was banned in the TCG prior to its release, being a problem card in the OCG causing various FTKs. Newly limited were Black Whirlwind, a hit to Black Wings after their world's performance, Dark Hole, returning from zero, Infernity Launcher, a massive hit to the combo potential of Infernity, Monster Reborn, returning from zero, and Royal Oppression, a hit to the big floodgate of the format. Newly semi-limited were Chaos Sorcerer, up from one, Du Lauren, down from three and as a hit to its OTK potential, Snipe Hunter, up from one, MST, up from one, Magic Cylinder, up from one, and Ojama Trio, up from one. Lastly, released from the list here were Black Rose Dragon, Cyber Dragon, Goblin Zombie, Treeborn Frog, United We Stand, and Royal Decree. The results of this list were pretty concrete, being the death of Frog FTK and a major hit to X Saber, being the highest performing decks of the previous meta. But it was still up in the air how the meta would shake out from here. The new Jump promo would be released the same day with Volume 8 Issue 9 bringing Malefic Stardust Dragon, a new boss that could be special summoned by banishing Stardust Dragon from the extra deck while a field spell is active, is destroyed if there's no active field spell, and prevents face-up field spells from being destroyed by card effects. While not relevant yet, Malefic Stardust would find a rather unique place in the meta later this year with the release of a certain set of support, which we'll get to soon enough. YCS Toronto would be the first event under this new ban list, taking place on September 4th, and clearly the meta was shaken up heavily, but no new decks would bubble to the surface from the change, although almost every deck ending in the top 16 here was playing at least one of the new staple three. Lazaro Bolito would take the event with x Saber, claiming his fourth major event victory, seeing a shift in ratios with the loss of Rescue Cat from the list, adding in a copy each of Valor, Duality, and Warning to take advantage of the new staple trio. YCS Bokum would follow two weeks later on September 25th, and this particular event would be massively important for the history of the game, not because of what was played, but because this was the first ever European YCS event, marking a point where active support was being given to the EU player base outside of the once a year WCQ. Scrap would see its first ever top here, writing off the initial wave of support with Chimera being a one card level seven or eight synchro, Gigantes being used for Synchro Extension and Tribute Fodder for Golem, and Scrap Dragon taking a far more interesting position here than any other deck, as Solemn Warning being used on Scrap Dragon in an actual Scrap deck can result in them simply getting another Scrap Dragon before the end of the turn thanks to its float effect still triggering if it popped with Warning. Machina Control was a new development in the Machina strategy, ditching the gadgets in exchange for more control-centric tools like Raikou, Spirit Reaper, and Fossil Dyna with Pot of Duality here pulling far more weight than some other decks in the format due to not necessarily needing special summons every turn. Synchro Plant was the newest evolution of the strategy from the previous Quick Draw Dandy Warrior deck, ditching the previously titular tuner for more control options like Doom Caliber Knight, choosing to rely more heavily on the generic Synchro Pool. Michael Gruner would take the event with x Saber, seeing a similar set of ratios to Lazaro's Toronto winning list, although dropping the duality in favor of an additional warning. YCS San Jose would take place the same day, and while some shifts were present in both tournaments, San Jose would show various differences in the development of the meta, particularly in the shocking popularity of Blackwing following the Black Whirlwind limit, playing more of a slower control game thanks to Pot of Duality and Icarus attack, with some builds also opting for Deck Devastation Virus to mix with Soroka. Aggro Dragon would be a new face in the meta here, claiming a single top 32 spot, being the first of many dragon decks in the future to be abusing the interaction of Future Fusion and Five-Headed Dragon able to effectively get five Foolish Burials for Dragons off of a singular card, which would standardly dump at least two Red MD and two Red Eyes Wyvern to set up for an end phase push to revive Red MDs with Wyvern's effect. Chaos Control continued to innovate and resurface every few months or so, now using the Dekoichi Black Salvo combo to make heavier dark pushes while also being able to provide Lights Engrave thanks to Valor's effect. 
Infernity would see a little revitalization here in the inclusion of Stygian Street Patrol, allowing you to special summon a stuck Archfiend in hand to get an additional search, giving Infernity a little extra gas with the recent limit of launcher. Angel Flores would win the event with Hero Beat, with the deck finding a new breath of air with the staple trio of D-Rev, as Duality in particular worked well with a strategy that heavily enjoyed sitting on a normal summon of Alias for multiple turns. Lastly for this group of tournaments was YCS Philadelphia two weeks later on October 9th, and from this event, Xaver would once again grow to take a major portion of the top cut, though notably not an overwhelming majority. Flamville would have a surprise appearance in the top cut here thanks to the recently released Baby, giving the deck easy access to monsters like Cataster, but now would also play a copy of Archer to access the level 7 pool in addition to the standard 3 copies of Magician, as the level 8 pool had grown substantially in power since their last top cut appearance with Scrap Dragon. Tan Nguyen would take the event with Synchro Plant, notably cutting the Doom Calibers from the list and playing more into the plant package with its only tuners being Debris Dragon and Spore taking advantage of Lonefire's ability to access your toolbox of options on a whim. This would be the last event before the next structure deck release, and while it would only bring a couple of new cards, it would set the scene for the next major meta threat just a month away. Structure Deck Merrick Release Date October 19th, 2010 Set Type Structure Deck Major Strategies Gravekeeper Impact foreshadowing at its finest. Structure Deck Merrick is one of the oddest structure decks of the entire 5Ds era, as it's the only structure deck to actually be based on a character from the anime in the era, a concept that wouldn't be revisited until late Arc 5 many years later. His primary strategy here was Gravekeeper, seeing reprints of Spy, Guard, Commandant, and even the more recently released Descendant alongside yet another reprint and errata of Necro Valley. For those unaware, Necrovalley is easily the most eroded card in the entire history of the game, with its effect changing so many times across the history of the game that it's hard to keep track of what effect it had when. With this particular errata, the grave locking effect was changed to negate anything that would move a card out of the graveyard except by their own effect, which gave the card a glaring blind spot compared to previous erratums. But I'm sure that won't come back to bite it at all. Other reprints of note here included Mystic Tomato, Lava Golem, MST, Book of Moon, Foolish Burial, Allure of Darkness, and Mirror Force, being a solid set of reprint selections. As for new cards, Merrick only brought two, which in itself was a controversial point because of which cards they were, being Mystical Beast of Circuit and Temple of the Kings. While Circuit was unremarkable, Temple of the Kings was a major issue card in the OCG, allowing you to activate trap cards to turn their set causing a various number of headaches as the primary balancing mechanism of traps was simply thrown out the window. Because of this, in a historic move, Temple of the Kings was completely banned from the TCG prior to its release, making it so that it could never be abused in the same way it had been in the OCG. Following this structure deck release, the next jump promo would be dropped into consumers' laps around this time, being Dark End Dragon, the first reprint of the previous SJC prize card. With this release, Every SJC prize card had now been reprinted for wide usage in the player base, marking a proper end to the circuit's influence on the TCG. With that said, there was one more core set released this year to help try and shake up the meta and shake things up it would, as it would introduce a couple of new cards to the mix that would completely redefine the late 5D's metagame. Star Strike Blast Release date, November 6th, 2010. Set type, Core Set. Major strategies, Karakuri, Dragoonity, Excel Synchros. Impact, Synchros and Overdrive. With the release of Starstrike Blast, various aspects of the game would shift rapidly over the coming months as we rapidly approach the end of the 5Ds era, as while Synchro spam strategies hadn't really been too prevalent in the last year or so, with the closest really being some Synchro Toolbox strategies, that aspect of the game would change with the release of a few Synchro tools over the coming months, starting with Formula Synchron, a level 2 Synchro tuner that drew a card on summon and could Synchro summon during the opponent's turn. This would be the start of a cascade of Synchro tools that would facilitate the idea of spamming out as many Synchros as possible within a turn to generate both advantage and fill the board with threats. With Formula being the first of these thanks to it being a tuner, meaning you could make it while setting up another Synchro for a free draw, and its ability to let you reactively Synchro on the opponent's turn, which means that you could, theoretically, make Black Rose Dragon on their turn and nuke the board in the middle of their setup lines. While the main cards of the set, Shooting Star Dragon and Red Nova Dragon, were meant to serve as the new direction of Synchro Summons, 
Neither one would see play at this time, with Shooting Star eventually finding a place in synchro lists in the distant future, but not for the reason it was meant to originally. Moving into archetypes, Karakuri was the newest synchro-focused archetype, with all of its pieces having effects that revolve around battle positions, with all of the main deck monsters having a condition to attack if they're able to, and switching from attack to defense mode if attacked, with Soldier summoning a Karakuri from deck if destroyed in battle, Merchant searching a Karakuri card on normal summon, Strategist swapping the battle position of a monster on summon, Ninja sending a face-up monster to the graveyard on being flipped, Anatomy being a continuous spell that gains a counter every time a Karakuri changes battle position to a max of two, able to be sent to grave to draw a card for each counter on it, and their synchro boss Bure, a level 7 machine locked synchro that can special summon a Karakuri from deck on summon and can swap a monster's battle position once per turn. While Karakuri wouldn't see success from this wave, it was notable for having swarming potential thanks to Bure's on summon effect needing just a little more to be viable. Watt Hopper was another piece of support for Watts that locked the opponent from attacking or targeting any Watt other than itself, making it effectively a new version of the previous dupe lock, able to lock both targeting and attacking if you controlled two. Scrap would receive a couple of new support pieces here in Searcher, who could special summon itself from Grave if your Scrap Monster is destroyed, nuking all non-Scrap Monsters on your field, and Scrap Twin Dragon, a level 9 scrap locked synchro that could destroy a card on your field to bounce two cards the opponent controls to hand once per turn, having the same floating effect as the previous scrap dragon. Nacheria Cherries could, when sent to the grave by the opponent, summon two more cherries from deck, being considerable as level 1 tuner options for plant strategies, but not nearly as much as Glow Up Bulb, a level 1 plant tuner that could, once per duel, revive itself from grave by milling a card from the top of your deck. This card would immediately slot into the previous Plant Synchro deck to be paired alongside Spore, giving Plants another level 1 tuner option, which combined with the newly released Formula Synchron gave the deck a significant boost in power. Speaking of, Tuning was a new search spell that added a Synchron tuner from deck to hand, then milled a card, becoming downright staple in Quick Draw Plant decks, although it was clear that Quick Draw variants were slowly on their way out with Glow Up Bulb's release. Vanity's Emptiness was a seriously odd card here, being a lock to special summons for both players until the owner has a card sent from deck or field to grave. This card would eventually be realized as one of the most toxic floodgate cards in the game's entire history, though for the time being was completely unrecognized for its actual power, seeing no play on release. Moving into the TCG exclusives, Skullmeister and Droll and Lockbird were two new hand traps in similar vein to Valor, with Meister stopping grave effects and Droll stopping searching for the rest of the turn after a card is added from the opponent's deck to hand. These two would see no play on release, being too niche in their applications, although they would both eventually find their niches in the coming years. Gravekeeper's Recruiter, when sent from field to grave, added a Gravekeeper with 1500 or less defense from deck to hand. This card alone would push Gravekeeper up substantially in the metagame, as now you had a worthwhile target to tribute off with Descendant to gain both field advantage and card advantage, which we'll see very soon. Sideblocker was an odd card, effectively serving as a single turn prohibition, seeing experimentation with side deck play from its release here. Kokimeru Wall would round out the rock Kokimeru monsters, giving a spell negate to match Guardian and Sandman's monster and trap negations, which while not immediate would spark the creation of an entirely new stun strategy. For the OCG imports, Ally Salvo was an offshoot of the Ally of Justice archetype, allowing the user to destroy two cards on field if destroyed in battle by a light monster seeing some side deck play against certain strategies. Lastly, Dragoonity was a new archetype of dragon tuners and wing beast non-tuners that aimed to synchro climb with its pieces. Oddly enough, two of its big synchro payoffs would be released here prior to the rest of the archetype due out in the last set of the year, being Vajrayana, a level 6 dragon and wing beast lock synchro who can equip a Dragoonity tuner from grave onto itself on summon, and could send an equip card on itself to grave to double its attack for the turn, and Gay Dirge, a level 6 dragon and wing beast locked synchro who could search a level 4 lower dragon or wing beast once per turn, then discard a dragon or wing beast from hand. YCS Mexico City would follow this release a week later on November 13th, but unfortunately we do not have much information on this particular event's top cut outside of the top 4 composition, being half and half X Saber and Blackwing. Jonathan Vasquez would win the event with X Saber, seeing a full line of duality and two warning in his list compared to the previous X Saber lists. YCS Milan would take place a week later, and while there was no definitive best deck at the event, there were many newish faces. Scrap would see multiple tops here thanks to its new support from Star Strike of Searcher and Twin, giving the deck recursion and wider board effectiveness in a game cleanup state. 
Chaos Plant would be yet another spin on Synchro Plant, placing more emphasis on Darks to add in both Dark Arm Dragon and Chaos Sorcerer to the lineup. Matthew Collins would take the event with Synchro Plant, adding in Glow Up Bulb to the lineup with ease, notably adding two copies of Formula Synchron to the extra deck as well. YCS Atlanta would be held the same day, and it would paint a far different picture of the meta than Milan, showcasing the difference in mindsets between American and European players. Synchro Plant would dominate this tournament, taking a third of the top 32, primarily thanks to Glow Up Bulb, providing a vast amount of utility to the deck as a whole by both being a reviving tuner for Synchro plays, and also as a piece for Caius to use to get onto the board. However, unquestionably the biggest shakeup here was Gravekeeper, who converted to take three of the top four in both spots in the finals, with Fraser Smith taking the event with the deck. Recruiter had been the piece the deck needed to be viable in the meta, being also one of the best decks to utilize Pot of Duality alongside Hero Beat, with a slow game being ideal for the deck, controlling what can stay on the board, what gets used in the grave with Necker Valley, and able to rip hands apart with Royal Tribute. Also worth noting is the side deck inclusion of Malefic Stardust Dragon, as it would slowly move into the main deck in the coming months being able to summon itself for free if you control Necro Valley and providing protection for said Necro Valley from removal, with MST being so prevalent in decks at the time. This would be the last event of 2010, but there was still one more set left to try and shake up the meta before entering 2011, and though its impacts were minimal at the time, it would grow to show its true power with time. Hidden Arsenal 3, release date, December 7th, 2010. Set type, deck building set. Major strategies, dual terminal wave 3. Impact, future sleepers and side deck sweepers. Hidden Arsenal 3, similar to 2 before it, aimed to give the legalization printings of various cards found in the dual terminal cabinets for TCG play, with most archetypes in it gaining something of note, even if it would be a while before they became impactful. R Gen X was a new offshoot of the Gen X archetype that searched and summoned specific levels of other R Gen Xs for board swarming, but effectively did nothing for the archetype in its current iteration, being instantly forgotten for now. Fabled would receive a couple of interesting pieces here in Cruz, who could summon a Fabled from Grave if discarded, and Ragin, a level 5 Fable locked synchro that let you draw until you have two cards in hand. While these two wouldn't be useful now yet again, they would find usage within the next year as new support and a new archetype would redefine what they could do. Jurak received a single interesting piece here in Gwaiba, who could special summon a Jurak from deck with 1700 or less attack, which could include itself. While not useful now, Gwaiba specifically would find an interesting home in the following year thanks to a new archetype release that would love the extra dinosaur swarming. Naturia would receive Sunflower, who could tribute itself in another Naturia to negate a monster effect and destroy it, being useful in the distant future. Cliff, who could special summon a Naturia from deck when sent to grave, which unfortunately missed timing so you couldn't get its effect by synchro summoning with it, which cratered its usefulness despite initial experimentation. And Barkeon, a level 6 earthlock synchro that could banish two cards from grave to negate a trap any number of times in a turn, being seen as a counterpart to Beast, seeing play outside of its archetype for the same reason. Ice Barrier would receive a couple of interesting pieces here in Dewdark, who could attack directly if all monsters you control are level 2 or lower, spawning an odd deck known as Wetlands Beatdown due to being a 2400 direct attacker under the field spell Wetlands, and Gungnir, a level 7 Waterlock Synchro that could discard up to two cards a turn to pop that many cards the opponent controlled, seeing some experimentation. Worms would see an interesting pair of cards here in Zex, who could send a worm from deck to grave on normal summon and can't be destroyed by battle if you control Jaegen, and Jaegen, who can special summon itself face down from grave if you control a Zex, and can bounce a monster on flip. These two would form an interesting control core which, while not too good for the current day, would become worth revisiting with a card release in the future. Dragoonity would get their main introductory wave of support here, receiving Ducks, who equips a Dragon Dragoonity to itself from Grave on Normal Summon, Legionnaire, who does the same and can send a Dragoonity card from the Spell and Trap Zone to pop a monster on field, Phalanx, who could special summon itself from the Spell and Trap Zone if equipped to a monster, and Gaybulge, a level 6 Dragon and Wing Beast locked synchro that can banish a Wing Beast from Grave to gain its attack for the turn when it battles. Dragoonity would have the bones of a competent synchro archetype here, with Duck specifically representing a 1 card level 8 synchro thanks to Phalanx and Vajrayana, but unfortunately for the time it was just not quite strong enough to become a meta presence. Lastly, Ally of Justice would gain a couple more tools to be used primarily as side deck tools against light strategies with Quarantine, who prevented the special summon of light monsters while on field, Cycle Reader, who served as a double DD Crow for light monsters, and Decisive Armor, 
a level 10 3 material synchro that, if the opponent controlled a light monster, can either destroy a set card, send a card from hand to grave to destroy all spells and traps the opponent controls, or send your entire hand to grave to look at the opponent's hand and send all lights to grave, burning them for each, once per turn, only getting one of those effects. And with that, 2010 would come to a close, being one of the most jam-packed years we've covered so far, with almost every set shaking up the meta substantially with its release. And it would only get more insane from here, as 2011 was just around the corner, ready to bring in new strategies, new staple tools, and the next major era of the game to the masses. Leaving 2010 and entering 2011, the 5D's era was nearing its peak. Hidden Arsenal 3 at the end of the previous year introduced many new tools to the format, none of which have had an opportunity to shine as of yet with no event at the end of 2010 to showcase them. In the meantime, 2011 would begin rather slowly at first, receiving a Shonen Jump promo to start the year off with the legalization printing of the Winged Dragon of Raw, holding a similar significance to Obelisk the year before, but seeing far less play due to both being more restrictive in its summoning and less overall good with its effect. With that said, the first set of the year would hit at the end of January, being Duelist Pack Yusei 3 on January 25th, but it brought absolutely nothing new to the table that would change the meta around it, with its primary contributions being reprints of Effect Veiler, Drill Warrior, Cards of Consonance, and Starlight Road, with the Veiler reprint really being the only draw to the set. With that said, the first core set of the year was around the corner from here, and it would be a far more fitting start to a pivotal year in the development of Yu-Gi-Oh! into the next era, bringing decks that were far cries from what came before. Storm of Ragnarok Release date, February 8th, 2011 Set type, Core Set Major Strategies, Nordic, Six Samurai Karakuri. Impact, speeding up the game to new heights. Storm of Ragnarok would be the set to throw caution to the wind in terms of the speed of the game, as its inclusions would not only shatter the prior speed barrier, but also put in place a pseudo failsafe that would become increasingly problematic the further into the future we move. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Starting with its cover archetype, the Nordic Aesir archetypes are not only their own separate intertwined archetypes, but the Nordic archetype itself is split into three subcategories, one for each of the Aesir boss monsters they summon, being entirely based on Norse mythology. These would be Loki's Nordic Alfars, with none being even remotely good, Thor's Nordic Beast bringing I am not pronouncing that Tangrisnir, who summons two Nordic Beast tokens on battle destruction, Gold Fox, a tuner that can special summon itself if the opponent controls a synchro while you control no monsters, and are you kidding me? Tangniustre. Who can special summon himself from hand if your monster is destroyed in battle, and can special summon a Nordic beast from deck by changing it from defense to attack mode. And Odin's Nordic Ascendants, who include Mimir, who can special summon itself from grave in the standby phase if you control a Nordic by discarding a spell, Valkyrie, who can banish two cards from hand on normal summon to summon two Einyar tokens, and Venatus, a TCG exclusive that can consider itself any of the sub archetypes for synchro summons, and can dump a Nordic from deck to grave to copy its level. Nordics at the time were almost completely overlooked due to another powerhouse deck being in the same set, and even then the strategy was so disjointed that it would see very little play, although it would see a small amount of success with a single YCS top later this year. Karakuri would receive another wave of support to help round out the deck into a powerful strategy with Watchdog, who boosts all Karakuris when you take battle damage involving this card, Ninja, who revives a Karakuri on destroying a monster in battle, Muzo, a TCG exclusive that swaps the defense at the end of the battle phase if it attacks, having 2100 attack, Beredo, a level 8 machine locked synchro that summons a Karakuri from deck on summon and draws a card the first time each turn a Karakuri monster changes battle position, and Cash Cash, which searches a Karakuri from deck to hand by changing the battle position of a Karakuri on field. Karakuri, thanks mostly to Beredo here, would continue to grow into a powerful synchro spam and advantage generation archetype but would continue to see no play for now as it was still exceedingly difficult to get a play line started for the deck without some kind of swarming tool. However, both of these archetypes would pale in comparison to Six Samurai, the next legacy archetype to get a massive overhaul, whose support here would completely warp the meta around it for the following month. These releases include Kizon, who could special summon itself from hand if you control a Six Samurai, boosting to 2100 if you had two others, 
Inishi, who could banish two Six Samurai from Grave to bounce a monster to hand, boosting to 2200 if you have two other Six Samurai. Kaigeki, who summons a Six Samurai from hand on normal summon, boosting to 1700 if you control another. Shinai and Mizuho, a duo that can special summon if you control the other, with Mizuho able to tribute a Six Samurai for spot removal once per turn, and Shinai recurring a Six Samurai if tributed. Kagemusha, a level 2 Six Samurai tuner. And Shien, a level 5 Six Samurai locked synchro that could negate a spell or trap once per turn and could protect itself from destruction by popping a different Six Samurai instead. They also received Sheen's Smoke Signal, which could search for a level 3 or lower Six Samurai, Ascentism, who could special summon a Six Samurai from deck with the same attack value but a different name than one you control, and Musakai Magatama, a counter trap for anything that destroys cards while you control a Six Samurai. Six Samurai would be insanely powerful from this release thanks to their ability to swarm the board insanely fast, which was exacerbated by the previously released TCG exclusive Gateway of the Six which meant you could effectively vomit the entire deck onto the field in a single turn thanks to Kizan and Grandmaster giving you effectively infinite counters for it, turning Six Samurai into an absolute menace going into the next YCS. Moving into the one-offs, Double Warrior was a level 2 warrior that could special summon itself from hand if you revive a monster, summoning two level 1 400 attack tokens if used for a synchro summon. This would be an interesting card for synchro strategies, specifically thanks to its interactions with Junk Synchron, who could Synchro Summon using Doppel to make Junk Warrior, whose attack gain effect would trigger prior to Doppel Warrior's token summon, meaning that the summon would happen before the attack gain, making your Junk Warrior 3100 attack and providing two level 1 tokens for continued lines. Divine Wind of the Mist Valley was a field spell that could special summon a wind monster from deck when a wind monster is returned to hand once per turn, which while not popular now, it would grow in popularity as a combo enabler with a couple of releases later in this year. Forbidden Lance could, by dropping a monster's attack by 800, make it immune to spells and traps for the rest of the turn, being both great for protection and for battle clearing thanks to being activatable in the damage depth to target an opponent's monster. Hope for Escape could, by paying 1000 life points while the opponent's life points were at least 1000 higher than yours, draw a card for every 2000 points difference between you and your opponent. While not played in any meta-relevant decks for the time, Hope for Escape was a tool that would be abused by many Exodia decks as we approached the event horizon of sorts. The Golden Apples could, when you take a direct attack, regain the damage you took and summon a token with equivalent stats, being an alternative to Gores in theory, but cratering on release and practice. Lastly are the TCG exclusives, including Chaos Hunter, who could special summon itself by discarding a card when the opponent special summons a monster, locking the opponent from banishing cards, and probably the most infamous card for the long term from this set, Max C, a hand trap that could be discarded to draw a card every time the opponent special summoned that turn. While not staple in the current day due to its fluctuating relevance, Max C would grow from here to be the end all be all staple of hand trap lines for years to come, being easily the most controversial hand trap in the game's history. YCS Dallas would be the first event of the year, taking place four days later on February 12th, and Six Samurai would clearly make a first impression on the format, taking a majority of the top cut, including first place piloted by Nizar Sahan, playing a primary line of Kaigeki with Kagemusha to access Shien, then swarm from there with all of the other various pieces thanks to Gateway, notably able to access Naturia Barkion in the extra deck thanks to Kagemusha and Kizan being Earths. In addition, Double-Edged Sword Technique effectively read as another one-card Shien thanks to being two Six Samurais, able to instantly dodge the drawback of the card by synchroing off the pieces it summoned. Cypher Soldier and Puppet Plant would see a good amount of popularity off of Six Samurai's popularity, with Cypher Soldier able to attack over Shien and Puppet Plant able to temporarily steal it, dodging all Six Samurai protections. Following Dallas, there was a less notable set release here, being the Bonds Beyond Time movie pack, which only printed the remaining Malefic monsters, all having the same condition to summon themselves by banishing their counterpart from deck or extra deck, only being able to control one Malefic at a time, destroying themselves if there's no active field spell, Parallel Gear, who can Synchro Summon with a Malefic in hand, Paradox Dragon, a Malefic locked Synchro that can revive a Synchro from Grave on Summon, Auto Dying if there's no Malefic World active, Malefic World, a field spell that could replace your draw for turn with an add of a random one of three chosen Malefic cards from deck, and Junk Gardna, who can swap an opponent's battle position once per turn. In this entire collection, the only card that would see any experimentation would be Malefic Cyber End Dragon, 
who would be splashed into some Gravekeeper list alongside Malefic Stardust. Following a little over a week later would be the GX Manga Volume 6 release, which brought Elemental Hero The Shining, a fusion of an Elemental Hero and a Light Monster who gains 300 attack for each Banished Elemental Hero, returning up to two Banished Elemental Heroes to hand when sent to Grave. This card would instantly be slotted into the previous Hero Beat lists, as it could be made with Alias and either any Hero or any Light Monster like Honest with Miracle Fusion, giving a powerhouse that also cycled your most important piece. On the same day as Shining's release, a new Banlist would go into effect March 1st, bringing a wave of necessary changes following Storm of Ragnarok's release. Newly banned were Goyo Guardian, Cold Wave, and Mass Driver, with Goyo being the best generic level 6 synchro, Cold Wave being abused for game-ending pushes, and Mass Driver being an FDK enabler, all of which were warranted. Newly limited were Kalut, Dandelion, Honest, Book of Moon, and Gateway of the Six, with most of those being necessary for some time, and Gateway being absolutely critical to prevent Six Samurai from completely taking over the meta. Newly semi-limited were Arc Lord Christia, Card Trooper, Debris Dragon, Spirit Reaper, Megamorph, Overload Fusion, Royal Tribute, Icarus Attack, and Solemn Warning, with most being understandable and Megamorph being a plain flat-out head-scratcher. Lastly, unlimited here were Chaos Sorcerer, Demise, Doloran, Snipe Hunter, Gold Sark, Skill Drain, and Ultimate Offering, with most of these being cleanup, but some being baffling, like Doloran, who had just been semi-limited for its OTK interactions, now being back at its full three. With the new list in effect, Eyes turned to the next structure deck at the end of March to see if Six Samurai could hold its new top position, or if the new strategy could give it competition in Six Sam's newly weakened state. Dragoonity Legion. Release date, March 8th, 2011. Set type, structure deck. Major strategies, Dragoonity. Impact, dragons rising into the meta. Dragoonity Legion was, effectively, the last couple of pieces of the Dragoonity strategy needed to make the deck anything near viable, adding in a couple of cards that would not only make Dragoonity a viable meta option, but would also put dragon strategies on the map for the foreseeable future thanks to one specific card. The new cards brought here included Armo Levaton, the boss of the structure, able to summon itself from hand by banishing a Dragoonity equipped with another Dragoonity, equipping one to itself on summon from Grave, Eccles, able to special summon a Dragoonity from hand and equip itself to it on summon, able to pop a card on field of sent to grave while equipped, and most important of all, Dragon Ravine. Ravine had two effects it could use by discarding a card once per turn, being either searching a level 4 lower Dragoonity from deck or dumping a Dragon from deck to grave, becoming a powerful option for almost every Dragon deck both now and in the future as it was effectively a once per turn foolish burial for Dragons. Reprints here would include Ducks, Legionnaire, Miss Valley Falcon, Foolish Burial, Card Destruction, Mirror Force, Bottomless, and Icarus Attack. YCS Charlotte would take place two weeks later on March 19th, and with it, some major shifts had clearly taken hold from the recent releases and banned lists. Makana Karakuri would be an interesting one-off in the top cut here, being a combination of the various Karakuri pieces to enable Synchro Summons, specifically with Strategists, to combine with level 4 machines to access Bure, and the first top cut appearance of Instant Fusion as a Synchro Extender, being used to summon Cybersaurus as a machine to extend into Beredo, in addition to the Machina pieces and a small e -telly package. Empty Jar would see a top spot here, being a deck primarily focused on quickly finding Morphing Jar through cards like Deep Diver and Gold Sarcophagus, then repeatedly triggering his flip effect with cards like AD Changer, Book of Eclipse, Moon, and Taiyu, enabling the card to quickly rip the opponent's deck apart five cards at a time. Dragoonity would see its first success here with two top spots, using Ducks and Phalanx to quickly climb into Vajrayana and from there into a level 8 Synchro. It was also the first big deck to take advantage of cards of consonants, as putting Phalanx and Eccles into the grave was ideal and getting two cards to do that made perfect sense. Hero Beat would see a massive resurgence into the meta here thanks to the new fusion of The Shining who gave a power play off of Miracle Fusion that also kept the engine rolling by recurring pieces back to hand when it left the field, also moving some players to include Snowman Eater into lists to provide access to Absolute Zero. Six Samurai had made an adjustment following the limit of Gateway, but was still clearly potent at making a board of Sheehan and friends quickly and reliably, using United as a way to generate counters for Gateway without extra copies of Gateway. 
However, all of these decks were not ready for another OTK deck appearing into the meta and taking the event piloted by Nikki Nikhail, being Fish OTK, a deck that aimed to quickly bring out Super Ancient Deep Sea King Sakilacanth to flood the board with fish monsters to synchro with. Specifically in Fishborg Blaster, who's made their second OTK deck appearance, and Oystermeister, who summons a level 1 token when sent to Grave. Because of this, you could synchro its token with Fishborg Blaster to make Formula Synchron, which in turn gave you draws to fuel more plays, eventually leading to a combination of Bryonic with other synchros to bounce a board away and swing for game. While not as uninteractive as Frog FTK the year prior, Fish OTK would be a bit of a detested deck in the metagame, which would sadly never take another top spot again in its current iteration, falling out of favor directly after this event. YCS Anaheim would take place two weeks later, and we'd see a bit of resettling of the format around the new big names, with the primary threats now standing out as Gravekeeper, Six Samurai, and Hero Beat, with Hero Beat taking the event piloted by Angel Flores for his second YCS title. There were two tech choices here that popped up a couple of times prior to this, but should be mentioned at least once. Those being Duradark, able to remove dark monsters in exchange for its attack that turn, specifically being used to out Xien, and Dragon Knight Draco a Quest, who could be made using Super Poly on an opponent's board to remove either a Synchro Dragon monster or a Warrior. YCS Paris would take place a week later, and for the most part we'd see similar trends to other events, with Steven Louise taking the event with X Saber, using Super Nimble Mega Hamster as an additional way to access Dark Soul. This would be the last event before the next couple of set releases, which would move to completely revolutionize the meta with the end of the era just around the corner. Hidden Arsenal 4, Trishula's Triumph. Release date, April 19th, 2011. Set type, deck building set. Major strategies, dual terminal wave 4. Impact, one synchro to rule them all. Hidden Arsenal 4, similar to the last three iterations, would aim to provide the legalization printings of the last wave of dual terminal exclusive cards for the first generation of the dual terminal lore, being the last wave until Hidden Arsenal would shift to the next generation. Starting with what received irrelevant support, Dragoonity would receive nothing of note here, being a failed follow-up to its prior structure deck. Neo Flamvel would be an offshoot to the prior Flamvel archetype, aimed at keeping the opponent's grave clear of monsters, which saw zero play and was extremely poorly timed with Necrovalley being a common sight in the meta. Jurak would once again see no relevant cards released here, although One Piece, Aeolo, would see play in later eras purely for being a level 1 dinosaur tuner, which would be relevant around 2017. Naturia would see a couple of new odd pieces in Stink Bug, able to send itself to Grave when a Naturia is attacked to end the battle phase. Landois, a counterpart to Beast and Barkeon for monster effects, but its cost being so specific that it wouldn't be staple like the other two. And Exterio, a fusion of Beast and Barkeon that combined their costs and effects, able to mill one and banish one from Grave to negate any number of spell or traps in a turn, seeing no play here but being considerable for fusion cheat outs later. On to the three archetypes that were actually relevant. Gen X Ally was a new offshoot of Gen X, aimed at attribute-focused effects to combine Gen X with the other hidden arsenal archetypes, with a couple of relevant pieces here like Power Cell, boosting all monsters with its attribute by 500 attack, Birdman, able to bounce a monster you control to hand to special summon itself, gaining 500 attack if it was a wind monster, Crusher, who pops a card on field if you normal summon a monster of its attribute, and the new synchros of Tri-Arm and Tri-Force, who gained various effects based on the attributes on monsters used to summon them. While Gen X Ally was an interesting strategy on paper, most of the pieces wouldn't do anything in the metagame for now. However, Gen X Ally Birdman specifically would become one of the most interesting pieces of the entire set, being a special summonable tuner that also recurs a monster from field to hand, being useful for all sorts of strategies. Fabled would receive a new sub archetype here in the form of The Fabled, a series of beasts that all have effects around being discarded or discarding cards, with Cat Sith destroying a face up card when discarded. Cerberell summoning itself when discarded, Ganashia also summoning itself when discarded, and Unicor, a level 4 Fable Locked Synchro that negated all cards and effects used by the opponent if you and your opponent have the same number of cards in hand on that card or effects resolution. Unicor specifically would spawn an entire new deck known as Unicor Control, specifically centered on maintaining the same number of cards in hand as the opponent to lock them out of the game. 
with the other fabled pieces providing backup as well as an engine of sorts for any deck looking to discard in the future. Lastly was Ice Barrier, who once again had no relevant main deck pieces, leaving the entire impact for their new synchro. This time being Trishula, a level 9, 3 material synchro that, on summon, banished a card from the opponent's hand, field, and graveyard, extremely notably not targeting. Trishula was, of course, the primary draw of the set, being arguably the best generic synchro in the format, able to completely blow apart setups going second and hand rip the opponent going first, which became more problematic for many strategies which looked to make multiple Trishula going first. This would be further accented by the next core set of the year, which would bring the core sets of 5Ds to a close while also giving synchros a swan song piece to revolutionize the mechanic one last time. Extreme Victory. Release date, May 10th, 2011. Set type, Core Set. Major Strategies, Tech Genus, Psychics, Six Samurai. Impact, The Swan Song of Synchros. Extreme Victory, being the last Core Set of the 5Ds era, was obviously setting its sights high, aiming to bring the first true Excel Synchro strategy to the masses in the form of Tech Genus, or TG for short an archetype aimed at cycling their pieces to build out massive synchro lines to climb all the way to their level 12 boss. Most of the main deck monsters of relevance here shared an effect that, in the end phase of the turn they're destroyed, let the owner search for a TG of a different name from deck to hand. These included Cyber Magician, a level 1 tuner that can synchro summon using a TG in hand, Striker, a level 2 tuner that can special summon itself if you control no monsters, Warwolf, who can special summon itself if a level 3 or lower is special summoned, Rush Rhino, who gains attack when attacking, Recipro Dragonfly, a level 2 synchro that can send a synchro to grave to revive its synchro materials once per turn, Wonder Magician, a level 5 TG locked synchro tuner that pops a spell or trap on summon and can synchro summon on the opponent's turn, Power Gladiator, a level 5 TG locked synchro that pierces, Blade Blaster, a level 10 Excel synchro that can banish a TG from grave to banish itself until the next standby phase and can send a card from hand to grave to negate a spell or trap that targets it, and Halberd Cannon, a level 12 3 material Excel synchro that can negate the summon of a monster once per turn and revives a TG when sent to grave. While TG was ambitious with its synchro strategy, the archetype would find a completely different niche in this time period, which we'll cover soon enough. Psychics would see a slight offshoot in a series of monsters focused on banishing each other temporarily with Esper Girl, who, when special summoned from the Banish Zone, banished the top card of your deck face down, adding it to hand when sent to Grave, Silent Psychic Wizard, who banishes a Psychic from Grave on Normal Summon, summoning it when sent to Grave, and Serene Psychic Witch, who banishes a Psychic from deck when destroyed, summoning it in the next standby phase. While most of these wouldn't see any play, Serene Psychic Witch would find an odd niche eventually. Six Samurai received a couple of new pieces in Elder, who could special summon itself if you controlled no monsters, and Sheen's Dojo, which gains a Bushido counter anytime you summon a Six Samurai, able to be sent to Grave to summon a Six Samurai from deck with equal or lower level. Dojo would be immediately slotted in without hesitation, but Elder specifically would spark an innovation in the deck involving the previous spell Ascentism, which we'll talk about soon. Moving into the single pieces, Unknown Synchron was a level 1 tuner that can special summon itself if your opponent controls a monster, seeing some experimentation in synchro spam strategies. Mystic Piper was a level 1 that could tribute itself to draw and reveal a card, drawing another if you drew a level 1, spawning a deck known as Mystic Piper alongside the previous spirit monster Kinkabiyu, who could revive a Mystic Piper each turn to trigger its tribute effect. Karakuri received Kamachi, a level 3 tuner that gave you an additional normal summon of a Karakuri each turn which would completely revolutionize Karakuri as a strategy, giving them more swarming potential. Debunk was a new counter trap that negates a monster that activates its effect in hand or grave, banishing it, seeing some side deck play. Safe Zone was a continuous trap that could prevent a monster from being destroyed by battle or card effect, destroying the monster if it leaves the field, being both a great protection trap as well as a piece of removal if it gets MST'd while face down. W Nebula Meteorite was a trap for the worm archetype, flipping all face-down monsters on the field face-up, flipping all light reptiles back face-down at the end phase, drawing a card for each, and summoning a level 7 or higher light reptile from deck if you did. Meteorite on its own would spawn an entire deck in the form of a control strategy with Zex and Jaegen from Hidden Arsenal 3, which again, we'll cover soon. For the OCG imports, the only one of note here was Scrap Othros, 
It will special summon itself from hand if you control the scrap, popping a scrap when you did. Also having the standard scrap recursion effect, being a useful piece for scraps both in swarming and in triggering their recursion. Lastly are the TCG exclusives, with three specifically impacting the meta at large. The first of these was Gladiator Beast Esadari, a contact fusion of any two Gladiator Beast monsters with no other effects, being an instant slot in for Gladiator Beast, giving a pseudo get out of jail free card for the deck to put pieces back into the deck for future tag outs. The second, and less short term impactful, but extremely impactful long term, was Tour Guide from the Underworld, a level 3 fiend that summoned another level 3 fiend from deck on normal summon, negating its effects and locking it from being used as synchro material. Right now, Tour Guide would only be decent thanks to summoning Sangan from deck to cycle and search with it, but was immediately bought out on release due to being obviously and intrinsically linked to the next major summoning mechanic coming in a few months with the next era of the game. The last, and easily most impactful in the short term, was Reborn Tengu, who special summons another copy of itself if removed from the field in any way, which completely revolutionized Synchro Summons by replacing the materials used immediately on Synchro Summon, being slotted into any and all decks that focused around Synchro usage. This would be immediately seen at YCS Orlando just under two weeks later on May 21st, where many, many new faces would appear in the top cut here. Gear Valley Stun was an odd one-off deck that combined a few different engines together to form a wall of massive beaters, specifically in the forms of the Malefic monsters of Stardust and Cyber End Dragon, being the Malefic summonable by banishing monsters from the extra deck instead of the main, and Gear Town to summon out Gachiltron Dragon by setting a new field spell over Gear Town, which naturally would be perfect with Necro Valley, able to stun out various strategies in the format. While the deck only saw one top here, it would grow as a popular anti-meta pick in the coming months. Doppel Synchron would combine the previous Plant Synchro with the one-two punch combo of Doppel Warrior and Junk Synchron, able to reliably summon Junk Warrior with 3100 or more attack, which provided the materials to extend further, usually into at least one copy of Trishula. Gadget Synchron Plant aimed to use the Plant Synchro pieces with a two-copy line of gadgets, Reborn Tengu, and Watchdog to access the toolbox of Synchros specifically with Watchdog able to flood the board with access to Beret and Beredo, who summoned another Watchdog on Summon, with the level 1 tuners and level 4 monsters providing easy access to Trishula reliably. Worm would make its first top here, combining the power of W Nebula Meteorite with the control of Zex and Yegan, choosing to summon King with the Nebula Summon effect. This was also one of the first meta appearances of Gen X ally Birdman, which provided recursion for Zex specifically and a tuner for level 7 synchro plays. Scrap saw a little bit of retooling thanks to a new Shonen Jump promo, Mechlord Emperor Granol, who could summon itself from hand if a monster you control is destroyed by card effect, able to steal a synchro to equip to itself once per turn, able to summon an equipped card, and gains attack and defense equal to half of your life points, a powerful boss that synergized well with the standard Scrap game plan. TG Stun was the primary deck to come out of the TG strategy, as all of their effects to cycle for more copies created an infinite conga line of monsters, using their archetypal trap TG1-EM1 to steal an opponent's monster and swap it with a TG, able to then run over the TG and get the search in the end phase. This was also one of the first sightings of Horn of the Phantom Beast for Sun strategies, able to latch to Fire Dog, King Tiger, Rush Rhino, or Warwolf to give an attack boost and draw power. Both Chaos Plant and Synchro Plant would see adjustments here to include Reborn Tengu, as a repeating level 4 body for Synchro Summons proved to be extremely powerful, especially when combined with a card like Gen X Ally Birdman, making the normal summon of a Tengu at minimum able to access a level 7 Synchro and another level 4 body, which in particular proved useful for Black Rose Dragon, as you could make Black Rose, Chain Link 1 Tengu, Chain Link 2 Black Rose to nuke the board, and you still get your last Tengu summon. X Saber, Gravekeeper, and Six Samurai would stand mostly unchanged in the meta with the exception of the Trishula slotted in for Saber and Samurai but there was a new form of Six Samurai that appeared in the top 32 here in the Incentism build. The idea of the build is that the newly released Elder had 400 attack, just like Kagemusha, meaning that with Incentism you could, without using your normal summon, get the materials for a level 5 Synchro, which extended further thanks to both Elder and Kagemusha being Earth, meaning that the level 5 could be Shein, but it could also be Naturia Beast, adding another layer to the control the deck could put up turn 1. Travis Massengale would win the event with Zombie Plant, taking similar steps to other decks in the format for easy Trishula access through the quick level 4 bodies zombies can flood the board with. 
With the stage set for Trishula's dominance of the format, the next set would mostly be yet another set of reprints, but a certain card in it would further push some of the new tools from Extreme Victory even further. Duelist Pack Crow, release date May 31st, 2011. Set type Duelist Pack, major strategies Blackwing. Impact, a single new combo piece for many strategies. Duelist Pack Crow stood as yet another reprint of the Blackwing core for competitive play. Effectively reprinting Gale, Bora, Blizzard, Shura, Armor Master, Armed Wing, and Cards for Black Feathers again, with Black Feathers being the only new reprint among these, being unnecessary at this stage. However, Crow did bring a single new card of note, that being Zephyros the Elite, able to special summon itself from Grave by bouncing a card you control back to hand and taking 400 damage once per duel. Zephyros would be immediately taken out of Black Wings and slotted into any number of decks in the format, specifically those using Reborn Tengu already, as by bouncing the Tengu with Zephyros, you trigger Tengu to summon another copy. This wouldn't be the only meta shakeup here, as two weeks after Crow, the next structure deck would release, and while it would take a minute for its pieces to become truly relevant, the strategy it brought would almost immediately be destined for meta viability. Lost Sanctuary, release date June 14th, 2011. Set type, structure deck. Major strategies, agents. Impact, the revitalization of fairies. Lost Sanctuary, being the last structure deck of the 5Ds era, would go out with a bit of a bang, releasing a wave of legacy support to the DM era archetype of agents, being a series of fairy monsters named for the different planets in the solar system. With this new wave, they received Earth, a tuner that searches an agent on normal summon, or Master Hyperion if you control Sanctuary in the sky, Jupiter, who can banish an agent from Grave to boost a light fairy by 800 attack that turn, able to discard a fairy to special summon a banished fairy if Sanctuary in the sky is active, Master Hyperion, the end boss for agents, able to special summon itself from hand by banishing an agent from hand, field, or grave, able to banish a light fairy in grave to pop a card on field once per turn, or twice per turn if Sanctuary is active, and Cards from the Sky, which banished a light fairy in hand to draw two, locking special summoning and the battle phase that turn. This wave would do a lot for bringing agents into the meta, mainly in that a dedicated fairy deck would naturally synergize well with Arc Lord Christia, who had latched itself to Lightsworn for the time as there were no other viable decks in the format with enough fairies to facilitate her, but with agents that changed. Reprints here included Agent Venus, Mystic Shineball, Tethys, Marshmallon, Hecatrice, Shining Angel, Soul of Purity and Light, Nova Summoner, Honest, Consecrated Light, Valhalla, Terraforming, Burial from a Different Dimension, Solidarity, Return from the Different Dimension, Torrential, and Solemn Judgment, making this one of the best locations for so many reprints in the current metagame for light decks in general. YCS Providence would take place four days later, and with it both Agents and Zephyros would make their way into the meta rather quickly to varying levels of success alongside a few new one-off faces. Fabled would see their first top here thanks to the new The Fabled cards from Hidden Arsenal 4, using cards like Snipe Hunter and the Tricky to quickly trigger their discard effects, using a combination of their Tuners and Reborn Tengu to quickly churn through cards thanks to Fabled Ragin. TG Synchro Plant would aim to break TG out of the stun archetype they had established previously, using their pieces with, of course, Tengu and Plants to facilitate quick Synchro Summoning. Water Synchro would be a sort of precursor to a Zexal era strategy, using Genex Undyne to dump Fishborg Blaster and Treeborn Frog out of the deck to search for Genex Controller, being more useful for the water dump than the actual search, enabling a level 4 Synchro straight away thanks to Fishborg. Herald decks once again saw a new pivot to take, specifically in the Agents from Lost Sanctuary, able to now consistently have a power pushing plan outside of the control from Herald. Agent would also see tops here in their own more pure variants, using Venus to flood the board with Mystic Shine Balls, and by extension Birdman since you could return a Shine Ball to hand, then just summon it right back out, easily giving access to Trishula and the four fairies in Grave for Christia. Tyree Tinsley would take the event with Synchro Plant, mostly using the same lines we've seen before, but now with an added copy of Zephyros for added level 4 access, providing quick access to Trishula like before. Shortly after Providence, the yearly Shonen Jump subscription bonus started hitting mailboxes, which brought probably one of the most broken pieces of Synchro Spam support yet in TG Hyper Librarian, who made the owner draw a card any time they successfully Synchro Summoned while he was on field. 
Hyper Librarian would be the piece that truly caused the cascade of Synchro Spam decks into the format, as now anytime you invest materials into a Synchro Summon, you get an immediate payoff in the form of a free draw, or two in the case of summoning Formula Synchron, which was extremely common at this point. Librarian's release alongside the next reprint set would form a cap-off point for the 5Ds era, as the new era, now only being a month away, was slowly creeping its influence into the player base, which would manifest rapidly when we entered the national season. Gold Series 4 Release date, July 1st, 2011 Set type, reprint set Major strategies, reprints of harder to get cards Impact, price falls, but little meta reprints Gold Series 4 is probably one of the weirdest Gold Series sets thus far, as while it brought a significant number of valuable reprints for cards that only had one expensive printing or were previously promos locked away from the EU, very few of the reprints here were actually meta-relevant for the time. Reprints of note here included Morphing Jar, Injection Fairy Lily, Gravekeeper Spy, Spirit Reaper, Chaos Sorcerer, Melteel Sage of the Sky, Prometheus King of the Shadows, Dark Lord Zerato, Doom Caliber Knight, Raiko, Celestia, Titaniel, Summoner Monk, Obelisk the Tormentor, Five-Headed Dragon, Gazarus, Soul Exchange, Toon Table of Contents, Trade-In, Royal Oppression, Deck Devastation Virus, Trap Stun, and most notably Blackluster Soldier Envoy of the Beginning, who was banned at this point in time, but this reprint effectively served as a warning signal for what was coming on the next ban list. With that said, the national season was just around the corner, but prior to the gauntlet beginning, the new era would peek in its head for a brief preview of events to come. Dawn of the Exceed Release date, July 12th, 2011 Set type, Starter Deck Major Strategies, The First Exceeds Impact, A Peek in That Affected Worlds Dawn of the Exceed would be the preview of the Zexal era, which was set to begin a month later with the new core set, bringing the first three of the new monster summoning mechanic of Exceed Summoning, a method that has a player take two or more of the same leveled monster to overlay for an Exceed monster of the same rank, notably not having a level itself, placing the monsters underneath the Exceed as Exceed materials. This would specifically be a bit confusing when it comes to rulings for a period of time after, but the long and short of it is that cards becoming material is not considered leaving the field, but a monster being detached as material is not considered leaving the field either. It's a bit complicated, but the two biggest cards this would affect were Reborn Tengu and Sangan, as Tengu would not get a summon after it was used as Exceed material, and Sangan would not get to search if detached as Exceed material which was an updated ruling from the OCG due to a litany of issues Sangan specifically caused. As for the Exceeds themselves, we received a rank 2, 3, and 4 to start us off, being Gachi Gachi Guntetsu, a rank 2 that could prevent its own destruction by detaching a material, boosting the board by 200 attack and defense for each material it has, Grenosaurus, a rank 3 that burned the opponent for 1000 by detaching a material when it destroys the monster in battle, and Utopia, a rank 4 who could detach a material to negate an attack, but auto-dies if attacked with no materials. Each of these would find a place in the meta shortly after release, with Utopia finding a slot in various decks using level 4, Gren being a target to summon using the previously released tour guide, and Gontetsu finding a home in Agent specifically, primarily thanks to Agent Venus providing its materials with the Shine Balls it summons, making Venus a 2000 attack beater that way. Reprints here included Giant Rat, Shining Angel, MST, Mirror Force, and Raigeki Break, being rather light, but reprints are never the starter deck strong suit. The EU Championships would take place three days later on July 15th, kicking off the national circuits, and though the new Exceed monsters were available, none would be played in the top cut as of yet, seeing primarily a shakeup in the form of the inclusion of Hyper Librarian into the format. For those of you scratching their heads like I was at the sight of Hyper Librarian in EU lists, even though it was just a Shonen Jump promo less than a month ago, all of the WCQ events across Europe in the last two months distributed Hyper Librarian as one of their three prize cards, making it legal to play in the EU on July 5th, which most players were not playing the prize card version, rather they played the SJ promo version from North America, which even after shipping prices was considerably cheaper. With that said, Hyper Librarian had a massive impact on the format at large by boosting Synchro Plant higher than it had already reached, taking the event piloted by Michael Gruner for his third major event victory playing two Librarian to facilitate resource generation while performing the standard Synchro plays. 
the North American WCQ would take place the same weekend, and we'd see similar results to the EU Championships, with Synchro Plant taking the majority of the top 8. Hansel Aguero would win the day on TG Stun, streamlining the deck's composition to a small monster line in addition to the inclusion of Skill Drain to further promote the stun game plan. YCS Indianapolis would follow three weeks later, seeing the prize card shift to Blood Mephist, who interestingly to this day has yet to see a single reprint since its prize card stint. As for the tournament itself, Synchro Plant would absolutely dominate, showing the power of Hyper Librarian in the format, but a couple of other interesting shifts occurred here too. Agent would move to include Gontetsu into deck lists moving forward, as the rank 2 was actually quite powerful in combination with Venus and her Shine Balls. Gear Valley Stun would grow in its popularity, restructuring to be entirely large boss monster focused, dropping the Greater Gravekeeper package in favor of Beast King Barbaros and Skill Drain, being one of the most powerful stun strategies in the format next to TG Stun. Gadget would see an odd resurgence here thanks to the new Exceed Utopia, which could convert any two level 4s into a 2500 beater with built-in battle prevention, proving to be quite useful. Robert Boyajin would take the event with Synchro Plant, being one of the first players to utilize Tour Guide to either summon a rank 3 or to summon Sangan to get its search effect by leaving it on the field. The final event of the 5Ds era would be held just a week later, being the 2011 Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship, at which we'd see a shocking rise in the popularity of Junk Doppel in the format, mixing the engine of that with Tengu Plants to form a powerhouse in the world's meta, though it would not take the day overall. Ogawa Takashi of Japan would be crowned the world champion this year with Agents, fully embracing Gontetsu as a power play for turn 1 in addition to Herald of the Orange Light, being easily the most powerful hand trap in the entire format, showcasing the lockout strength of Christia. This would be the final event of the 5Ds era as all eyes turned to the next core set releasing 3 days later, as with it, the Zexal era would begin in full and major shifts in the player mindset were bound to take hold from their introductions. A huge shout out to my Dark Law level patrons, Dammit Marka, Heyo, Jukes, Otaku GamerX, Prinrin, and Riser339, as well as all of my other patrons over on Patreon.com. If you'd like to support the channel, consider following me on Patreon, where support tiers start at as little as $1 and you get access to all my videos a day early. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to the channel, that way you don't miss out on any future videos. Every subscription helps out more than you think. Thank you all again, and I'll see you next time.